Good afternoon. My name is Rafael Espina. I am the chair of the, on the Committee on Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing. I'm joined today by my colleagues on the committee. We have Karen Coslowitz from Queens, uh, and we have a special guest, Helen Rosenthal, who is a co-prime of Intro 936. In today's hearing, we will hear feedback on three pieces of legislation. Intro 936 will prohibit single-use plastic beverage straws and beverage stirrers. Intro 823 would allow restaurants uh, to put surcharges. Intro 965 uh, would, is relating to applications for retail dealer licenses for the sale of cigarettes or tobacco products. I'm proudly sponsoring Intro 936, which would ban food service establishments from providing non-biodegradable plastic straws and beverage stirrers. As a cheap, durable, and easy manufactured product, plastic has saturated our markets. However, the life cycle of plastic means that it can stay in the environment for tens, hundreds, or even thousands of years. Much of it ends up in landfills, and at least 8 million tons of plastic leak into oceans each year, the equivalent of dumping a garbage truck full of trash into the ocean every minute. Because plastic are less dense than seawater, pieces of plastic float around the ocean. They often break down into smaller pieces, which end up being consumed by fish and bird life, or they remain floating on the surface. Off the coast of California and Hawaii, there is now a landmass that is twice the size of Texas, made up nearly entirely of plastics. And make no mistake, this isn't just a faraway problem. Plastic straws in specific are among the most common items found on our beaches here in New York City. In fact, on the very day we introduced this bill, a team of scientists, journalists, and everything but water employees, led by Dr. Marcus Erickson, found that there are as many as 130,000 plastic straws locally in the waterways along Manhattan in both the East River and Hudson alone. It's no secret, plastic straws are choking our natural environment. Millions are used every day, or more often than not, they are provided out of routine and then tossed away by customers, ending up in the landfill or our beaches. The east of such plastic items makes them Next time, and our relationship up to them is often through habit rather than need. My bill, Intro 936, aims to change that behavior and take one concrete step to solve the global waste problem from here in New York. Generally speaking, most people do not need a straw in order to consume their drinks. I do recognize, however, that that, that isn't always the case. That is why Intro 936 has provisions for people with medical needs that do require straws to still have access to them. It also allows establishments to provide straws and stirrers so as long as these items are biodegradable. And it offers a two-year grace period so that our businesses, in big, big and small, can have time to make the necessary changes without facing a fee. Some institutions across the city already have similar practices in place. Our zoos and the aquarium have all banned plastic straws, as well as cold drink lids and single-use plastic bags, while some restaurants, many of them who are here today, only provide straws when a, cons when a customer specifically requests it. These restaurants, cafes, and organizations are clearly part of the shift in attitude regarding single-use plastics. Worldwide, studies have shown that more than 90% of people now favor bans on plastic straws, and cities and countries across the globe are implementing their own versions of the plastic straw ban. The second bill is Intro 823, sponsored by Councilmember Borelli, would allow restaurants to add an additional surcharge to customer bills. At the moment, Section 559 of the rules of the City of New York prohibits such charges unless they are for a bona fide service, such as splitting a meal or a mandatory gratuity for large parties. However, with the cost of running a restaurant in the city continuing to rise, the surcharge option may help alleviate some of this pressure on restaurant owners. Governor Cuomo is also currently holding hearings across the state examining whether to eliminate tipping. If such a proposal is implemented, this may leave restaurant owners vulnerable to wage increases that they will not be able to cover without introducing a surcharge. The final bill today, Intro 965, will address administrative issues that arose after changes we made to licensee for tobacco retailers late last year. The bill implements a grace period and time extension that would permit pre-existing tobacco retailers to continue the license registration process with the city. This bill will not alter the current cap on licenses. The council remains committed to reducing the number of tobacco retail dealers in New York City. This will simply avoid putting already existing retailers out of business. We look forward today to hear from the administration, the business industry, representatives, environmental advocates, and other stakeholders about the recommendations regarding these three bills. Um, now I would like to turn to the panel. Uh, we are also joined by Peter Koo from Queens and Brad Lander from Brooklyn. Uh, so we have the first panel. We have Adrian Grenier, um, the, uh, one, one of the founders of Lonely Whale, John Cavelli from the Wildlife Conservation Society, 
Vanessa Vargas, the Wildlife Conservation Society, Lauren Singer, uh, a local New York City restaurant and business owner, uh, and Andrew Riggi from New York City Hospitality Alliance. So you may, you may begin. Thank you. Uh, hello, my name is Adrian Grunier. I am an actor, a UN Environment Goodwill Ambassador, co-founder of Lonely Whale, and a proud New Yorker, bred right here in New York, Manhattan. I'm here today to testify on public record in support of intro number 936 legislation introduced by Council Member Espinal to ban plastic straws and stirs in New York City's eating and drinking establishments. When Lonely Well considered the best way to reduce plastic pollution and protect marine wildlife and human health, elim eliminating straws was a natural starting point. Since we began our work on the topic under our Strawless Ocean Initiative, We've seen the conversation around plastic straws flourish with policy passed in Malibu, Seattle, Taiwan, Vancouver, and ongoing legislation in San Francisco and in both the UK and the EU. But not yet in my hometown, not my backyard, until today. This bill introduced by Councilman Member Espinal is a cr critical next step in the global m movement for clean seas. Plastic pollution is not only a threat to the planet, but also to our human health. One metric ton of plastic enters the ocean every four seconds. If we don't change our habits now, most of us in this room, and certainly our children, will live to see the day when there is more plastic in the ocean than fish. I've seen the destruction firsthand in my work with the UN environment and here at home in New York City. Last February, I helped the UN Environment launch their pivotal Clean Seas campaign on the shorelines of Bali. Even for someone intimately aware of the plastic pollution crisis, I was shocked when I walked down the beach picking up handfuls of plastic and straws were among the most prominent in my collection. Growing up in New York City, I was always aware of my environment, the corner store, the kids playing on the corner and down Broadway, my messy room. But I learned that the environment is not just what I see, but it is what we share, and it's all connected. I learned that what goes in our rivers, two of the greatest which hug our city, flows directly out to sea. And since I was a kid, my mom taught me to clean my messy room. What I later learned, and what I hoped we all learn, is that my room and our room was not just in, our, in Brooklyn, but my room was an entire shared earth. That is why I stand in support of Councilman, Councilman Espinal so that all New Yorkers are presented with the opportunity to live in a clean room and to lead by example because their government recognizes it's the right thing to empower a city to protect its shared environment. We have seen corporations such as McDonald's in the UK, Tom Colicchio's Crafted Hospitality, Alaskan Airlines, Live Nation Entertainment, and most recently, Brooklyn's very own BSE Global, including Barclays Center, home of the Brooklyn Nets, begin to lead the way, opting to preempt policy with bold announcements to transition their plastic straws to marine-friendly alternatives and empower their customers, and their fans. The investors behind these brands have not only realized their fiduciary duty to understand their portfolio's impact on the environment, but have also leveraged their early leadership into increased brand value. Governments also have a duty, a duty to protect and empower the people they serve and the brand of the cities they represent. For this reason, I am calling on you our government leaders to meet the market and mirror their leadership and to protect your invest investments, our communities, by passing this bill. While serving our ocean will take much more than a ban on plastic straws, all corporations and governments must start somewhere. This one is an easy first step. As demonstrated by the citizens and businesses who have already embraced this movement, opting for marine-friendly uh, alternatives. New Yorkers care about others. They care about things outside themselves, and they want to make the right choices for their neighbors and for their planet. So let's make it easy for them. It shouldn't be a burden on people to choose between their environmental, morals, and convenience. 
So I urge you to level the playing field to include all people, which would eliminate an approximate 16 million plastic straws from the city every single day by passing intro number 936. We have market-ready, marine-friendly paper straws. We simply need to demonstrate to business owners at the scale of the city that this alternative is available in on demand. Nature is in peril. Plastic pollution knows no borders. It doesn't discriminate against race, ability, class, countries, cities, or even continents. We are truly in this together, and it's vital we unite as New Yorkers to begin addressing plastic pollution. Intro number 936 offers an opportunity to New Yorkers from every borough, every industry, and every walk of life a seat at the table in this global movement for a strawless ocean. So I hope you will join me, join us, in protecting our city's legacy by voting yes on intro number 936. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before we move forward, um, I do want to give my colleague, Helen Rosenthal, a chance to speak on the bill. She is a co-prime sponsor. Helen? Thank you so much, Chair Espinal, for your leadership, for your partnership. Really appreciate everyone from the panel today um, and everyone here who's uh, interested in participating in this conversation. As Chair Espinal discussed, the environmental impact of single-use plastic straws is significant. It's high time that we as a city start to take a comprehensive look at single-use plastic and work to mitigate the alarming impact it has on our landfills, waterways, and oceans. The time for this conversation has come. Great alternatives to plastic exist, and they're growing more affordable and available every day. I have personally started using paper straws in recent weeks, and they have proven surprisingly effective and durable. But we have to be thoughtful inclu and inclusive as we consider this step. As we tackle the problem of single-use plastic, we cannot do so at the expense of people with disabilities. I know that this ban has been considered in other places and members of the disabilities community who rely on straws have been left out of the conversation. Let me say this, that will not be the case here in New York City. It is a false choice between sustainability and accessibility. We simply have to achieve both. I know Chair Espinal shares that commitment. Intro 936 includes an exemption for people with disabilities. Today, I look forward to hearing about how to strengthen it and ensure that this legislation truly does protect all New Yorkers and those New Yorkers who rely on straws, especially for those, whom, uh, those for whom the alternatives to plastic would not work. Today, we're talking about straws. This broader issue, though, of ensuring what is sustainable is also made accessible will be a fundamental challenge in our time. As we tackle the effects of climate change and pollution, it will make, mean making changes to our products, to processes, to our way of life. It is incumbent on us to ensure that those in the disability community are not just considered, but are at the table as we design a more sustainable future. As much as we like to be leaders, New York City will not be the first to ban plastic straws. Other cities, countries, and even some companies beat us to the punch. Where we can lead, though, is by enacting this legislation in a truly inclusive way after a truly inclusive process. Thank you again, Chair Espinal, for your partnership. I look forward to working with you, Councilmember Grudenchik, and all of the people in this room across and across the city as we move toward a more sustainable and more accessible New York. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. And I just want to recognize Margaret Chin from Manhattan who has joined us. Thank you for being here. 
Um, the next person can testify now. Good afternoon, Mr. Ch Chairman, um, Council Members Clausewitz, Rosenthal, Kuhns, Landers, thank you so much for all being here, and Chin. Uh, it is an honor to have all of you here. My name is John Cavelli. I'm the Executive Vice President of Public Affairs for the Wildlife Conservation Society. Uh, WCS is a global conservation organization. Um, many of you know us as the Bronx Zoo or the New York Aquarium. Uh, we run the four zoos in the aquarium here in New York City but we also work in 60 countries. And in the sites where we work, it's home to about 50% of the world's biological diversity. Um, one of the reasons that we've gotten very engaged in this issue is because we do see, I think as Adrian referenced, what's happening around the world, the impact of plastic around the world. But um, I saw it myself in, in the Caribbean at one of our sites. It is tragic what we are doing to our own planet. And I think we want to take a sensible step forward. And actually, later this month, we'll be opening a new exhibit at the New York Aquarium called Ocean Wonder Sharks, where you can learn a bit about the waters around New York. But uh, the payoff is actually learning more about marine plastics and what we can do to make our, our, uh, our environment better. So to talk about plastics just for a second, you've already heard so many amazingly sad statistics. Let me add just a couple more. The use of plastic has increased 20-fold in the last 90 years and is expected to double in the next 20 years. Um, by 2050, there will be more plastic than fish by weight in the oceans. That is why, with Intro 936, New York City is aiming to do its part to tackle a key source of plastic pollution directly. Plastic straws cannot be recycled. I, I, if you have not gone, I would suggest taking a tour of the recycling center in Brooklyn. About 800 tons of plastic are, being, are attempted to be recycled. It's a visit every New Yorker should go to to see what we are actually doing to our own planet. In speaking to the people there, the one piece of plastic that is never recycled are plastic straws because they are too small and they end up either in a landfill or they end up in the oceans. So in our oceans, you know, what's happening? We've heard so much about humans. I just want to talk for a moment about wildlife. 70% of all birds, 30% of all turtles have been found with plastic in them. I think many of us have seen what's happened with the whale that uh, was killed in Thailand with 18 pounds of plastic in its stomach. Uh, the fact is that what we're doing is just horrendous. So intro 936 for focuses on eliminating single-use plastic straws and stirrers at food establishments throughout the city of New York. In support of that effort in intro 936, WCS has launched a campaign called Give a Sip. Dot or, uh, dot NYC. Again, that's giveasip.nyc. Giveasip asks New Yorkers to basically take a pledge to stop using plastic straws, and if they're so moved, to uh, write to their local council members and inform of, them of their support. So far, in about the month since we uh, launched, we've had 80,000 people take the pledge. We now have 154 New York City businesses from Dead Rabbit to Zero to Nova in the Bronx, from the Bronx to Staten Island, and all places in between. Uh, we've been able to engage major businesses as well as bodegas. I think what we've learned here is that this cannot be about one part of New York City. It has to be about all of New York City. It has to be from, from the bodega down the street to the restaurants that we go to uh, to eat. It has to be about everybody, and that was one of the things I feel that we tried to do differently this time. We wanted to make sure that we included and engaged everyone. And one of our major partners is the Yemeni American Merchants Association. I say that proudly because they are one of the, own, many of them are owners of some of the bodegas that we all go to on a daily basis. Uh, as you've heard already, this movement is growing. Um, it has taken on, a, in some respects, a life of its own, which is exciting. A lot of major companies have already taken the pledge. Some places around the world have taken a pledge. Maybe it's the hubris of being a New Yorker, but I think if New York does this and you show that type of leadership, New York will help spur this movement to the next level. And I will say that one of the good things is um, if you do take the pledge at, um, at our site at uh, giveasip.nyc, you will actually be able to get a free paper straw to get you started on that journey. So hopefully you'll, uh, you'll join us. So with that, thank you very much for the opportunity to testify today. Let's tackle this challenge together, one straw at a time. Thank you very much. Thank you. L Lauren? Hello, everyone. My name is Lauren Singer. I am a New York City native, NYU graduate. 
very proud New York City resident and local business owner of Package Free Shop, who our customers, through their purchases, have helped to prevent over 3.5 million straws from going to landfills in one year of business alone. I just want to make a note for those with disabilities that require the use of a plastic straw. I support your use of a straw to go about your everyday tasks. Uh, I commit my business and my team, who is also here, to finding a better solution for you than plastic straws and commit as well to trying to find a reusable multi-use alternative that's ergonomic and provide them at cost for those who need them. Five years ago, I made a decision to stop making trash in order to align my values for environmental sustainability with my everyday actions. I started by not using plastic and then transitioned to a zero waste lifestyle soon after. It was a smooth transition, but the road could have been a lot less bumpy if I didn't have to go so out of my way to make more sustainable choices. For instance, having to call restaurants in advance to ensure that they would not send 40 people's worth of plastic cutlery with my one person delivery order. You guys know. Making sure bars didn't give me plastic cups for water, and most frequently, I have to watch bartenders like a hawk when I'm ordering a drink after work to make sure that they don't add three straws and a stir. I only have one mouth. Why would I need three straws? Plastic straws pollute our oceans, contribute to human health conditions like cancer, and what's more, using straws, according to my mother, gives you mouth wrinkles. <laughs> so even if you don't care about the environment, Nobody wants those. Our habit of using plastic straws is not just unsustainable, it's archaic. Plastic straws are already being banned in so many places, and we need to get on the bandwagon. Do you like that? We are supposed to be the leading city in the world, but places such as San Luis Obispo, Davis, Malibu, Manhattan Beach, Oakland, Richmond, Berkeley, Seattle, Edmonds, Monmouth Beach, Fort Myers, and Miami Beach have all banned plastic straws. Earlier this year, the mayor added $89 million in city funds to DSNY's budget from 2018 through 2021. The New York City Independent Budget Office projects that costs will continue to rise from $392 million this year to a whopping $420 million by 2021. Decreasing the amount of trash we produce as a city is not just good for our environmental policy, it makes extreme financial sense as well. When New York City passes this ban, it will keep an estimated 13,600,000 plastic straws out of landfills every single day. That's about 5 billion straws per year, or 46,000 625 school buses full of plastic straws, and I'm not even counting stirs. Making a change like this, banning single-use disposable straws and stirs, that is being a leader. That is being the best city in the entire world. As a born New York City native and business owner, my team and I, who are all here, are eager and hopeful to work in parallel with City Council member Rafael Espinal to phase out single-use straws and stirs, items that neither contribute to the financial success of our city nor the health of our incredible citizens. I represent a rapidly growing demographic of individuals and business owners living in New York City who are sick of single-use plastic, who absolutely think that straws suck, and who pledge to support New York City in all endeavors that help to contribute to the reduction of single-use disposables and thus a more economically, socially, and environmentally sustainable city. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you. My name is Vanessa Vargas. I'm currently a sophomore at Edward R. Murrah High School, and I'm part of the, w the Wildlife Conservation Corps, the WCC. I'm here representing my other 14 partners in WCC I work with. The purpose of the Wildlife Conservation Corps at the New York Aquarium is to advocate for ocean conservation and to focus on how plastics affects us and the oceans. As high school students, we are part of a reputable, reputable program that educates us and inspires other high school students to engage on ocean conservation and educate others who are not aware. It is vital that we seek to inform and inspire people of all ages on, about how plastics are affecting all of us and how we're not conscious of its presence and impact. The Give a Sip campaign provides us the opportunity to do just that, translating these city-wild initiatives into calls of actions. 
As teens, we are soon to vote and expand our voices even more. On behalf of the WCC, we thank Council Member Espinal, members of the committee, New York City businesses, and other AMIO voices we've heard from. We hope all of us take meticulous actions to protect our beautiful local seascapes and our marine wildlife. We are one step closer to making our oceans happy and our marine life beautific. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Andrew Ridgey. I am the executive director of the New York City Hospitality Alliance. We are a trade association that represents restaurants and bars throughout the five boroughs, uh, many of which have been real leaders in uh, sustainable business practices, whether it's sourcing from uh, or, you know, farmers, organic vegetables, uh, from farms upstate, or working with sustainable fisher fisheries, our members recognize that the, their mission is not only to serve delicious food and create great experience for their guests, but do so while they're nurturing the planet. So after carefully considering uh, Council Member Espinal's intro 936, which bans the use of single-use plastic straws and uh, stirs, uh, as an alternative, restaurants would have to use, bar, uh, and bars would have to use uh, compostable plant-based or paper straws, or, as others said, just not use uh, straws at all. We support this legislation. Um, now, as you know, restaurants are, and bars as well, are really over-regulated, and it's always been a major concern. But I think this bill today shows that we're not always concerned just about any regulation. We're okay with sensible regulation, and we believe things that support our environment are positive, and that's why we're here to support this. Um, we actually surveyed our members. We had about responses from over 400 restaurants and bars throughout the city. More than 85% of them responded to the survey in support of the ban. And then about 10% of them weren't sure if they support it or they don't support it. They had questions about the types of straws that were on the market, the cost, the quality. And then a small percent just outright, you know, just opposed it, mostly because of the cost. Um, we obviously take all these concerns uh, to consideration, but we believe if you look at the size of the New York City market, once that's unleashed, it can significantly reduce the price of the straws. Also, I think it will also increase uh, the quality and the availability um, as well. Uh, we're also pledging to work with different manufacturers to make sure that the restaurants and bars can get access and information about the different options that are available to them. Um, we do have a few comments on some of the text of the bill we would like uh, you and your fellow uh, members uh, to consider. First, I mentioned the size of the New York City market. It's enormous. Um, I know that you do have the provision for two years that there will not be violations issued um, to these uh, businesses if they're not using compostable uh, straws. Um, however, we think that's great. We just want to make sure that there's a mechanism in the bill that if there is still not sufficient supply on the market after that two years, that the appropriate, appropriate agency has the authority to put the fining and violations on hold. Because we don't want businesses to get fines because they're not using compostable straws when they're saying, I can't get enough straws for my supplier. Um, that's the um, first part. Uh, the second, uh, we also think that the enforcement should be moved. Um, you know, we had a colorful history or uh, industry with the health department. We do think that the Department of Environmental Protection would be a more appropriate uh, agency. We also think for legal reasons that that would be a smart move as well because it would impact not only restaurants but all businesses that are using straws, and it would reduce the chance that it would be subject to a legal challenge similar to the sugary drink ban, which only impacted restaurants uh, selling sugary drinks, but not, did not impact the bodega next door or the grocery store um, impacting, uh, uh, impacting those businesses. So while we support sensible regulation, we always think that it needs to be fair and equitable um, for all of the businesses. Um, Finally, the question about disabilities, which you had mentioned, which is really important. Um, one of the questions that I think we should all discuss perhaps offline, um, if a business does opt to keep plastic straws on hand for people with disability, it does pose legal questions under the uh, New York Human Rights Law as well as the Americans with Disability Act. How would an employer or a server or a bartender know whether or not they could use uh, or give that customer the plastic straw. 
uh, asking questions about a potential disability obviously um, you know creates some challenges as well as putting people in that position which I don't think we want to do but overall we really appreciate your consideration of our comments we support this. New York City restaurants and bars want to be a leader in the environmental movement. So many of, uh, of them are already doing it as well, and we are there to support them uh, throughout the way. So thank you again uh, for your leadership. Thank you. Thank you all for your testimony. I know we just have one or two questions from my colleagues. I want to give them a chance. We have Helen Rosenthal. Oh, I'm sorry. It was a comment. I have to gush. Okay. So, Lauren. A great website. <laughs> Thank you. Can't wait to shop at your store. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for everything you're doing. The cards look fabulous. <laughs> Zero waste solutions for leftover herbs. I'm down with all of this. Thank you. You should share your testimony. It was really good today. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that very much. Yeah. Thank you, and uh, nice to see you all. Thank you all for testifying and taking the time, and thank you everybody here in the audience for taking some time on a few important issues here today, and of course, to Councilmember Espinal, who, uh, in addition to me being a big, very big fan of Espinal, I always find him to, to be taking up uh, big issues around, uh, around the city. Um, I want to ask to, to Mr. Riggi um, a couple of questions about the hospitality um, business on the straw. I, I know you guys are testifying in support of mm -hmm. it with some conditions around making sure that um, <laughs> the industry can comply and can stay. Is the, is, um, I mean, that was, this was the first thing I thought of when we mm -hmm. were talking about it was what would be the impact on the operator in a business. Is, I, a couple of questions. Is there a cost consideration related to the, the switching from one to the other? There is. Uh, we spoke with some distributors. There is an increased cost, um, so that's certainly a consideration. Uh, again, a lot of restaurants have already moved to this. One of the things that I've heard from restaurateurs and bar owners um, is that as part of their transition to a compostable version, they've also been trying to get people not to use straws at all. So if you're not giving straws to everyone, that helps reduce the price a little bit there, um, which can you know, push a little money over to buy the compostable versions. Um, so there definitely is a more of a cost. Um, but as I mentioned in my comments earlier, I think that the size of the New York City market, that purchasing power will be able to dramatically bring down the cost uh, over time. And the and, and I think this is your other point. You're saying that you believe that moving from the plastic to the to the paper or mm -hmm. other alternative. I think I saw a metal straw somewhere recently that the um, the potentially it would it would incentivize stop the stopping of distributing as the situation we mentioned the three straw situation for one drink one person um, do you believe that that would have an impact on the people if the cost was going up the disincentive to give out straws I, I certainly think that's part of it I also think just there's a mentality switch that we heard a lot of the other speakers talk about when you start talking about sustainable practices um, it starts to change the culture around the activity. So the hope would be that many people in restaurants would start saying, well, do you need a straw or not even giving a straw? You know, one of the things I know I spoke with other people is, you know, have it upon request. So, you know, not every drink needs a straw. Some do. Um, the other thing is just speaking with manufacturers. I think there are specific types of straws. When you look at cocktail bars, when you have uh, uh, pebble rocks like pebble ice, um, what kind of straw is appropriate for that? Uh, bubble tea. Um, you know, you need a big, thick straw. So I know that there's, you know, different concerns and different types of cuisines and communities. So just being conscious of all of that. But I think the two-year rollout um, period before fines are issued and really putting pressure on the manufacturers and the producers to make sure the quantity and quality is there um, before a business is going to be fined. And that's the only concern. And the council member has been excellent uh, at supporting small businesses. So we think he and all of you will continue to do the same. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Any other comments? Questions? All right. Thank you. Oh. Yeah, sure. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I just want to like, point out that you said before uh, in the Asian market, there's a huge market of like, bubble tea. Yes. No. In Fashion, we have hundreds of bubble tea stores. No. So the bill is good. We just have to allow the store owners to find substitutes. Mm -hmm. 
because th their straws is not a typical straw. This is much wider and maybe yeah. triple the size of the regular mm -hmm. straws. And they, they bend it a little bit because they want to suck out the bubble. Mm -hmm. Council the, member, the, the I, I, have, I have a 19-year-old at home. That was the first thing <laughs> yeah. he mentioned to me. It was a yeah. significant concern. Yeah. <laughs> so, yes. Council member, we provide those options at Package Free Shop. Yeah. Boba so and straws, we, we have them. <laughs> So uh, uh, I think we should uh, take into consideration they allow uh, a certain amount of time for them to transition uh, to other substitutes. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Brad? Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks for your leadership on this issue. As you know, can, reducing plastic waste is a high priority of the whole council and of mine, and I'm thrilled we finally were able to uh, make progress on styrofoam and that we're moving forward there, though that's not the subject of today's hearing. We'll keep moving on a lot of other products as well, but I appreciate your leadership. Thanks to the panel. And I'll just join the comments that I'm confident there is a way to make sure that we meet the needs of, the of people with disabilities in a smart solution. When you give out products for free, what you find quickly is many, 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 many more people use and waste and throw them away than the people who need them. And there's room to figure out how to make sure people who need them can get them and people who don't need them aren't throwing them out into the oceans in wanton, enormous values. So thank you uh, to the panel. Thank you for the, your leadership. I look forward to working with you and your co-sponsors and, and the folks who are here today to get to the right solution. Thank, thank you. you all. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Thanks for testifying. Thank you. Up next, uh, I want to call up the administration. We have Tamala Boyd, the New York City Department of Consumer Affairs, from the New York City Department of Consumer Affairs. We have Casey Adams from DCA. We have Mark Chambers from the Mayor's Office. And we have Dr. Mary Bassett, the Commissioner of DOHMH. You may begin, Doctor. Good oh, afternoon. Sorry, get with the uh, yeah, be the elf. Please raise your right hands, sir. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee, and to answer council member questions honestly? I do. I so affirm. Thank you. Chairperson Espinal, members of the Consumer Affairs Committee. Uh, before I move to my prepared testimony, I would like to apologize in advance that as the chair is aware, I'm going to have to dash out uh, shortly after my testimony. I'm Dr. Mary Bassett, the Commissioner of the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on Introduction 965. Since 2002, New York City's adult smoking rate has dropped by 39 percent, from 21.5 percent in 2002 to 13.1 percent in 2016. And the youth smoking rate has dropped by a whopping 72 percent between 2001 and 2017, from 17.6 percent to 5 percent. However, more than 850,000 adult and 13,000 young New Yorkers still smoke, and an estimated 12,000 New Yorkers die from tobacco-related diseases each year. Up to half of the people who continue to smoke will die of a smoking-related disease. This may be old news, but it is still true. Nationally and here in New York City, tobacco use remains one of the leading causes of preventable death. Less than a year ago, New York City regained its place as a national leader of smoking and tobacco control policy with the enactment of a historic package of laws. This comprehensive package protects New Yorkers by increasing the price of cigarettes and other tobacco products, as well as reducing access to tobacco products and exposure to secondhand smoke. And it will help us meet our goal to reduce the number of smokers in the city by 160,000 over three years. These laws will help thousands of New Yorkers live longer, healthier lives, and the city is working diligently to implement them. Local Law 146 of, of 2017, one of the laws enacted as part of the package last year, takes a multi-pronged approach to restricting access to tobacco products. The law updates the existing cigarette retail license to include all tobacco products, and it establishes a process for reducing the number of licenses to sell these products over time 
by implementing a cap on the number of retailers per community district. Retailers that did not apply before the deadline and wish to receive a license now must wait until the number of licenses in their community district falls below the cap dictated by local law. Research shows that easy access to tobacco retailers makes it harder for smokers to quit, and regular visits to retailers that sell tobacco products make youth more likely to try smoking. We estimate that this strategy may reduce the number of tobacco retailers by up to 40% over the course of 10 years. And the administration stands firm in its support of this law. New York City has a higher tobacco retail, uh, retailer density than San Francisco, Boston, or Philadelphia, with approximately 27 retail stores per square mile. At present, the Department of Consumer Affairs licenses more than 8,000 retailers who complied with Local Law 146 by applying for and receiving a license during the application period. Intro 965 would create a special carve-out to allow some retailers that missed the deadline to apply for a tobacco retail dealer license. This would give these retailers a significant advantage in receiving licenses regardless of the cap, thus undermining the protective intent of the city's package of tobacco laws. Based on com a comparison of data maintained by the city and state, DCA believes that it is likely that the majority of the retailers eligible for this exemption to the local law would be located in central Brooklyn, the Bronx, and upper Manhattan. These neighborhoods of color already carry the highest burden of poor health outcomes in our city and are often a target for predatory marketing practices by the tobacco industry. The administration cannot support the current draft of this bill and the potential harm to the health of New Yorkers that it poses. This bill would allow more sales of these deadly products to continue in neighborhoods where we work tirelessly to address health inequities. We look forward to working with the council to ensure that its commitment to public health is maintained. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. We are happy to answer questions. Kim Kessler, who leads our tobacco control efforts uh, at the health department, will be pleased to answer any questions regarding the impact of tobacco on health. Thank you. As you know, uh, 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 Mr. Chair, the reason that I'm leaving is to join, join the First Lady at a press conference about child separation, an issue that I know the Council feels very strongly about as well. Thank you for your leadership on that issue. Appreciate it. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Espinall, members of the Committee on Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing. My name is Tamela Boyd, and I'm the General Counsel for the New York City Department of Consumer Affairs. Today, I will present testimony on Introduction 823, a bill that would allow bars and restaurants to impose surcharges unrelated to any additional services requested by consumers to the amounts already owed, so long as the bar or restaurant makes certain specified disclosures. DCA protects and enhances the daily economic lives of New Yorkers, including consumers, workers, and business owners, to create thriving communities. By supporting businesses through equitable enforcement and access to resources, and by helping to resolve complaints, DCA protects the marketplace from predatory practices and strives to create a culture of compliance. Through its community outreach and the work of its offices of financial empowerment and labor, labor policy and standards, DCA empowers consumers and working families by providing the tools and resources they need to be educated consumers and to achieve financial health and work-life balance. DCA also conducts research and advocates for public policy and furthers um, its work to support New York City communities. As a licensor and regulator, DCA hears from businesses both large and small every day. One of the things we've learned from these interactions is that while New York City presents businesses with unique opportunities, those opportunities come with unique challenges. Because we recognize these challenges, DCA has made educating businesses and helping them understand and comply with our laws and rules major agency priorities. DCA conducts hundreds of outreach events, including business education days, licensee open houses, online live chats, training webinars, and other events each year. 
Last year, we rolled out our new visiting inspector program, which provides new licensees with no fine visits by a senior inspector to identify problems and help businesses correct them before a fine is issued. Thanks to this program, the first interaction that a new licensee has with a DC inspector will be collaborative and educational rather than potentially punitive. Notably, DCA also collaborates with our sister agencies across the administration to streamline the services we offer businesses and to make the regulatory process more efficient. We routinely seek feedback from businesses on our education and outreach events and have even instituted business roundtables critical, as critical feedback sessions for our commissioner and senior staff. Um, in fact, Chair Espinal, I think the last time I saw you, we shared a panel at one of those uh, business roundtables. Um, in the hospitality industry specifically, DCA enforces key consumer protection and workplace laws and licenses the sidewalk cafe activity of almost 1,300 restaurants across all five boroughs. All new sidewalk cafe licensees were offered VIP inspections. Our licensing and enforcement divisions regularly interact with the industry and our external affairs division has a direct line to many industry advocates. So while we understand and appreciate some of the challenges particular to the hospitality industry, industry, DCA opposes this bill's attempt to authorize the imposition on consumers of surcharges on top of the stated price of menu items and unrelated to any additional service requested by the consumer. Currently, a DCA rule prohibits the imposition of such surcharges, but nothing in this rule prevents businesses from setting their menu prices at a level sufficient to cover their expenses, turn a profit, and grow their operation. What DCA's rule does prohibit are attempts to mask part of these prices as surcharges. Social science research, both from inside and outside the hospitality industry, has long indicated that the manner in which a price is presented can have a profound effect on how consumers perceive that price. For example, a recent study found that consumers rated menu prices that included an automatic service charge of 15% or less as better deals than menu prices that factored in the cost of that service, even when the total price, uh, when the total amount paid by the consumers was the same. Similarly, research has shown that consumers tend to be price focused, meaning that they concentrate on the total price of an item or, ser or service, often to the exclusion of other fees or charges associated with the purchase. DCA believes that consumers have a right to have terms and prices communicated to them in the way they can understand and internalize. Allowing businesses to mask price increases as surcharges takes advantage of a consumer's perception that they're getting a deal when in fact they are not. We believe that preventing that behavior is a common sense consumer protection and thus we oppose intro 823 in its current form. DCA will continue to work diligently to make it easier for businesses to understand and comply with the important protections for consumers and workers that we are charged with enforcing. We take our mission of helping consumers, workers, and businesses very seriously, and we are happy to engage in further conversations with you about any legislation that furthers that mission. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and Casey and I will be happy to take any questions that you have. Thank you. Um, Keith has a question. I, I oh, you, 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 there's one more person. Sorry. Thank you. Go right ahead. No problem. Good afternoon. My name is Mark Chambers. I'm the director of the Mayor's Office of Sustainability. I want to thank Chairperson Espinal and the members of this committee for the opportunity to discuss Introduction 936, banning single-use plastic straws and beverage stirs. I want to say at the outset that the administration strongly supports this bill provided that it addresses the needs of people with disabilities and others who may still require use of plastic straws. Single-use plastic straws and stirs are a pernicious problem uh, and source of pollution. They are among the most common type of litter worldwide. Ending our reliance on single-use plastic like straws, stirs, and plastic bags, especially when there are viable, convenient, and sustainable alternatives available, is a shared goal between the administration and the council and aligns with the city's zero waste and 80 by 50 greenhouse gas reduction commitments. It is also an issue that the public is urging us to act on. Simply put, plastic straws and stirs are very difficult, if not impossible, to recycle. According to the Department of Sanitation, plastic straws and stirs are too light and too small to be caught by the screening mechanisms in our mechanical recycling sorters. They drop through the sorting screens and mix with other materials contaminating recycling loads or getting disposed as garbage. 
Mostly because of their size and weight, it is difficult for the city to track how many single-use plastic straws and stirs are sent to landfills. But the national statistics suggest approximately 30, 13 million straws are used and discarded each day in a city as large as ours. That adds up to over 4.7 billion straws a year. Assuming those 13 million straws make it to trash cans, that volume is the same as putting approximately six school buses per day or over 2,000 per year into landfills. Making matters worse, single-use plastic straws are also made with dirty fossil fuels. Polyethylene, the, most, the type of plastic most commonly used for plastic bags and straws, is most often derived from crude oil and natural gas. The EPA estimate, estimates that for every ounce of polyethylene produced, one ounce of carbon dioxide is omitted. For example, the, the emissions from a year's worth of straws would be like burning over two million pounds of coal. In 2017, New York City residents discarded more than half a million tons of plastic in, in either the refuse or recycling streams, about 15% of all residential waste. New Yorkers sorted less than half of these plastics into recycling bins. The rest went straight into landfills. Bills like Introduction 936, limiting plastic waste, will not only help us to meet our zero waste goals, but also help us cut our carbon emissions. By banning these single-use plastics, we can help cut emissions associated with manufacturing straws, but also cut noxious emissions closer to home. Reducing waste reduces truck traffic and increases our air quality. Beyond their climate impacts, plastic straws and stirs also pose environmental harms. Single-use plastics don't biodegrade or break down, <coughs> don't biodegrade, but they break down into even smaller pieces of plastic. And as health studies increasingly show, they are entering the food chain. Straws and stirs are among the most common piece of garbage found on the beaches in the United States. Trash, like single-use straws discarded in New York City streets, wash down catch, catch basins and end up in our waterways, threatening our marine wildlife, putting human health at risk, negatively impacting recreation facilities, and costing our taxpayers millions of dollars to clean up. Enforcing Introduction 936 will be crucial to its effectiveness. Given the Department of Consumer Affairs limited oversight with the food and beverage establishment, the administration suggests vesting the authority to enforce this bill with the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, which already inspects these establishments. While the administration supports the principal environmental goals of Introduction 936, we also want to acknowledge the concerns of the disability community that, that the bill as written may not adequately address the needs of people with disabilities who require plastic straws. We hope to work with the council to address these concerns and would support amendments to ensure that people with dis disabilities are not adversely af affected by the passage of the proposed legislation in collaboration with our colleagues at the mayor's office for people with disabilities. Banning single-use plastic straws and stirs is an important step to cut our plastic consumption, but our plastic problem will only get bigger if we do not take additional steps. Driven by cheap natural gas prices, fossil fuel companies like Exxon and Shell will invest over $160 billion in the next five years into new facilities to produce the raw materials for everyday plastics. New investments like these could undermine efforts to reverse plastic pollution and lock in plastic production for decades to come. The good news is that the movement to ban single-use plastics is gaining momentum. Across the country, voluntary grassroots efforts to curb plastics have led to lo local governments pursuing bans and fees on single-use plastics. California and Michigan have banned plastic bags. San Francisco banned bags and has an ordinance prohibiting municipal funds from purchasing plastic water bottles. Malibu banned all plastic straws, stirs, and utensils. And in July 1st, 2018, Seattle became the first city in the country to ban the widest range of single-use plastics uh, plas including bags, utensils, and straws. Here in New York City, the council banned the use, <coughs> excuse me, here in New York City, the council banned the use of its funds from purchasing plastic water bottles. Next year, thanks to our recent victory on, in litigation, the ban on foam food service products will go in, finally go into effect, preventing this pernicious and environmentally unfriendly substance from flooding our streets, landfills, and waterways. As you know, Mayor de Blasio remains firmly committed to reducing waste from single-use plastic bags, and we look forward to continue, continuing to work with the council on this issue. Through Mayor's Office of Sustainability's Green NYC program, the administration has engaged tens of thousands of New Yorkers in making different choices that have big impacts for themselves, their city, and the planet. 
More than 30,000 pledged to bring their own bottle, bag, or coffee mug. And in coordination with the Department of Sanitation, we've handed out more than 550,000 reusable bags and 23,000 reusable bottles to show practical, sustainable, and convenient alternatives to single-use plastic items. In conclusion, I want to thank Chairman Espinal and the committee for introducing this important and necessary bill. My office stands ready to work with the council to explore ways that we can tackle plastics pollutions together in ways that adequately address the concerns of the disability community. We are proud of our efforts to date, but recognize that we have to be bolder than ever before because the challenges are greater than ever before. I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, before I give it to Keith, I just want to thank the administration uh, for being on board. Uh, you know, as the day we introduced this bill to ban plastic straws, the mayor came out publicly that same day to say he's on board. So we're very grateful. Thank you. Um, with that said, I want to uh, pass the mic to Keith Powers. Thank you. Appreciate it. And I'm sorry I have to run shortly after this, but I want to just ask about the restaurant surcharge, so, uh, something that is sort of relevant right now because of the state conversations going around, on around the tip credit. And I think that's been one of the reasons that the, uh, the those in the hospitality business have requested an ability to add a surcharge. So for, I, a couple of questions. One, in, is, it, is, it, is it illegal today? I mean, there are certainly places where you can add on a gratuity, whether it's for size or splitting a bill or other reasons why you'd be able to add on a, a surcharge or, you know, or, or some other charge. So, so wh wh why is that illegal versus the other, the other ways that you can add a charge on today? Yes, Councilmember, you're right. There are situations where DCA's rule does permit the addition of a surcharge, and those are situations where the surcharge is connected with an additional service. So you re reference some of these examples where a restaurant is providing service for a large party, where a restaurant is allowing substitutions to its normal menu, where it is allowing customers to split the bill. So the difference between those situations that, uh, that we both described and what is prohibited by the DCA's rule is that there is an extra service being provided. So it's explicit in the, is it DCA rules, the rulemaking, or is it in the admin code where it's explicit that you have to be providing an extra service in order to collect the charge? It's a DCA rule. DCA rule, and it is explicit that it, that's an it exemption is. in? Yes. Okay. Thanks. And, the, and I, think, I think in the testimony offer, there was questions around the, um, or there was the, the comment, I think, was around the sensitivity around pricing with the, con the customer, which I, I actually thought in some ways made the point for the, the industry, which is that there's sensitivity to changes in pricing that does impact consumer behavior, and certainly, you're, you're, I think, correct to say that it would be, we would be concerned around the consumer having costs that, you know, don't appear on the menu that end up on the bill. I think the proposal from Councilmember Borelli is to disclose it up front. Um, but it, it does not, does, doesn't that argument, I, I guess, that, doesn't that argument appear to seem to be supportive as well of the industry's argument that they can add a charge on because the sensitivity and the increased pricing that would impact consumers? Uh, I, I don't think we agree that that proves the point. I think we think it proves uh, exactly the opposite, council member, because the consumer is still paying that, uh, that amount. And I want to be clear that nothing in DCA's rule prohibits a restaurant from raising its prices, as we said in our testimony, to a level sufficient to turn a profit, grow their business, expand elsewhere. Um, what it does prohibit is, use, is masking that price increase as a surcharge. So we, th we think consumers have a right to receive that information in a way that is upfront and easy to understand. That was the reason this rule was originally promulgated, and we still believe that today. And is there a difference for the consumer if they're, if they're purchasing an item at a higher price or getting a disclosed surcharge? I mean, in terms of the price sensitivity. I, I think, by the way, I think there's very good arguments on, on both sides, and I'm sensitive to the ones that the industry has raised about rising costs. I'm just asking a question. I mean, the, the, if, the if the concern is around masked fees and the bill says you have to disclose those fees up front, is there a difference between rising, raising the cost on a hamburger versus putting a clear and distinct service charge at, on the menu? The research we referenced in our testimony was looking at precisely that question, and it found that there was a difference in consumer perception of the price when part of the price was, dis was uh, described as a surcharge, 
or a service charge as opposed to disclosed in the price itself. And I think the, the industry is well aware uh, of that consumer perception issue, and I think they've pointed to that when talking about this bill publicly. It is our position that the, that the consumer it, the balance should shift to the consumer. In other words, if there is a consumer perception issue here, we believe that the consumer has a right to get the information in a way that is easiest to understand for them. And again, that's always been our position and is our position across many industries. Meaning look at the menu and know what the price of the item you're buying is rather than the right. price plus something else. Right. I appreciate that. Um, and the um, the last question I have is you guys, I know, said you can't support in its current form. Is there a form where you'd be supportive of a surcharge, a disclosed surcharge, and would it be? I know some cities have it, so that has to go directly to the to, to the employer, uh, to sorry, the employees to cover. Health, you know, I think Santa Monica, Santa Monica has one that is about healthcare costs, or goes directly to the employee rather than the owner. Is there is there a version that you would you would uh, the DCA or the administration would support? As we said in the testimony, we're always open to discussing legislation with you that uh, fulfills any part of our mandate, consumers, businesses, or workers. As we started off this line of questioning, there are situations where surcharges are, uh, are permitted now in connection with the bona fide service. So I can't speak to hypothetical proposals, but I think we're happy to engage with you to look at um, other possibilities, but we don't support what's on the table right now. I have one last question. I'm sorry to take up all the time. Are you guys opposed, is the city opposed to the fees that appear when if it's eight groups or eight or more, um, those are disclosed on the menu, I think, often. I don't know if they're required to be or not, and you pay them at the end. Are you opposed to, or are you supportive of eliminating that? Are you describing a situation where there's a surcharge imposed for service, service added, large groups? Uh, it's, it's, it's a, I think it's a similar situation. It is a disclosed fee on the menu for a service added, in this case, that then you pay at the end that's not reflected in the cost of the item on the menu. Does the administration believe that that should be eliminated? Uh, I'm not familiar with precisely the situation you're describing. I, I, as we have, were talking about in our exchange, right now it, a restaurant is permitted to impose a surcharge Correct. for the service of large groups. That's not prohibited by our rule, but um, we can follow up with you if there's a specific situation. I'm not... Um, well, I guess my question was, there, the, the situation seems similar to me. One is a surcharge for a one both are both are disclosed on the menu at the beginning of the meal but are not reflected in the price of the items that you purchase mm -hmm. in one case you seem to be against it in the other one the dc the dca rules allow for it so i'm just i'm just trying to understand the discrepancy between the two council member i have to apologize because i'm not sure i'm totally following your distinction the dca rule does not uh prohibit i'm asking for the yeah. logic between the two you guys are opposed to one and you're supportive of the other in your rules so what is the difference between one disclosed fee on the menu and what between the and then the other the rule currently prohibits across the board surcharges that are not connected with an extra service so i understand sorry with all respect i understand the rule i'm asking for the support of repealing it based on the similar logic. Council member, I, again, I, I think there's a little bit of a, a breakdown of communication here because we, if a, if a restaurant imposes a surcharge, they disclose it, they say this is for groups of eight or more, they will not receive a violation. Correct. Do you, and you support that? We, that we think is connected with a bona fide service, in this case, the service of a large group. So that's always been allowed by our rule. I, I just, okay, I'll end there and I'll follow up with you guys. I think my point is that the logic that there is a fee that you pay at the end of the meal that is not disclosed, in, or that, sorry, that is not revealed in the item that you're paying for. So if you're buying a hamburger, it's not reflected in the cost, it's reflected at the end, it's a surcharge. That logic, even though it's for service, still apply, I think would similarly apply on the bill that we're talking about today. You seem to be opposed to the current bill but your rules allowed in other situations where the logic continues. So I, I, I'm happy to follow up with you guys to, to talk about it in more detail. My point being, I think there's some allowable scenarios where the logic still prevails that you're, it's not disclosed up front or in the item, but yet you guys seem to oppose it here. I'm happy to follow up with you guys on it. Well, just to be clear, there would, it would still need to be uh, disclosed, even if, it, if it's permissible under the current rule because it is a, a surcharge for a bona fide service, like service to a large group, it still needs to be disclosed under, under the current. I'll follow with you guys. Yeah. Thank happy you. to.
Thank you, guys. Um, thank you. I'm going to call up the next panel. Keith answered all the great questions. Thank you. Um, we have uh, Leah De Ario from Oceanic Global Foundation. Shayla Moro, Mo sorry, if I mispronounced her name, it's just because I can't really read it. Sh Shayla Morat, <laughs> Crayon Collection, Youssef Mubariz from the Yemeni American Merch Association, Belis Blitrago, the Billion Oyster Project, and again, if I mispronounced her name, I apologize, just trying to read uh, what I have. And Lisa DiCaprio from the Sierra Club. Yeah, we're going to have a clock of three minutes for testimony. No, you're not. There's like I'm going to take a break for two minutes. I'll be right back, OK?
All right, I want to call up Sharon. We're going to call up another panel. You have to come back. Sorry. Good. Sharon Shapiro and Joe Rappaport from the Brooklyn Center for Independence of the Disabled. Christopher Grief, Person with Disabilities. Mrs. Ann Manino. Deborah Grief. Edith Prentice and Elizabeth Ramos. Okay. All right. Okay, whenever you're ready, uh, just state your name for the record, and then you may begin. Whoever wants to start first can start first. Just say your name oh. for the record. My name is Sharon Shapiro Rack, and today I am representing BOLD, the Brooklyn Center for Independence of the Disabled, and Yad HaKadzika, the Jewish Disability Empowerment Center. The members of the council, I represent two fine disability organizations, and I am a plastic straw user. The bill as written must be rejected by this council. It does not go far enough to protect food service customers who need to use plastic drinking straws. It's unfortunate that once again, Policies are drafted without effectively consulting the disability community. Any future bill must be drafted directly in consultation with organizations including independent living centers that represent people with the broad array of obvious, of obvious and hidden disabilities. I personally have 
have had this date for sips of the result of a no plastic straw policy. I am un unable to use paper straws because I am unable to control the pressure with which my mouth holds the straw. As a result, paper straws flatten at the mouth tip. For example, when I go to the Brooklyn Botanical Gardens Cafe, I'm told that they do not carry straws. My husband has to hold the cup to my mouth in order for me to drink. And, and this draws public attention to my drinking. This compromises my privacy and dignity. Why don't you carry your own straws, you may ask? I ask you, have you ever drunk through a plastic straw that has been transported in a bag or a pocket? It often becomes bent or punctured and is not usable. Also, I ask you, why don't you carry your own fork, knife, or spoon when you go to a eatery? You expect these utensils to be provided to you by the food stand or restaurant. Plastic straws to customers who require them are directly analogous to eating utensils for all eatery customers. We expect that beverage vendors will provide plastic straws. The drafters of this bill made an attempt to address the situation. However, the related provisions are inadequate. Given that drafters did not, uh, as opposed to what was said, did not get adequate input from relevant representatives from the cross disability community. What works for a quadriplegic may adult may not work for an artistic child. The bill says that food service establishments may provide, may provide suitable beverage stores. No, it should not be may provide, but it should be must provide, which would subject the store owner or vendor owner to a, an ADA lawsuit if he or she does not 
provide a place to cure. And this disease acts to help also to build places the owner on the customer to prove that he or she has a disability. This is absolutely unacceptable. The bill must explicitly state that the customer must not bear the responsibility of proving that they have a disability and needs a plastic straw. Plastic straws must be provided to any customer upon the customer's request. Please reject this bill and work with the full array, the full array of straw reliant users and their representative organizations to draft a bill that addresses the concern of straw users and he was he environmentalist. Thank you to the committee. Thank you. My name is Edith Kirk. Oh, sorry. I can't back up. Okay. <coughs> <coughs> My name is Edith Brentis, and I desperately need a drink of water. But I won't. I'm the president of the DIA. There have been two recent articles in the Huffington Post that explain the importance of plastic straws to many people with disabilities. The first is, I need plastic straws to drink, I also want to save the environment. And two, straws save lives like my, mine, don't ban them. Both articles explain why plastic straws are better for the authors than other drinking straw options, for example, glass, plastic, metal, rubber, silicone. Many of us have tried them, and they're some of them are pretty gnarly. I had an accident with my first metal straw and took five stitches in my mouth. So I'll never use metal again. Um, I was very disappointed that this bill reached the chamber without discussion and consideration with people with disabilities. You would think that in 2018, more than 25 years after the ADA, the council would be more knowledgeable and sensitive to the issues of disability. This week, there was a CODA hearing, there was a, there was a CODA event at a, at a bar on the Lower East Side, and we were assured it was accessible. Well, do people lie or do people wish? It wasn't, including the bathroom. The accommodation was that we should go up and down the illegal ramp to the subway store next door, which had a bathroom. Instead, I left. Um, earlier this year, Queen Elizabeth, banned plastic straws and bottles from Buckingham Palace. Last night, Chelsea Clinton tweeted her support for 936. Even the intro sponsors and co-sponsors have had the audacity to decide for people with disabilities what straws we could and should use, despite their obvious total lack of knowledge about drinking straws. I doubt many people with disabilities get to Buckingham Palace. I don't think it's really accessible. Um, or care what Hillary Clinton has, to, I'm, I'm sorry, Chelsea Clinton has to say, I'm, I'm mistake there, about the straws, but it's our right to have the straw that works for us. Neither politicians nor environmentalists should decide what type of straw people with disabilities use. Although intro 936 includes an out for people with disabilities or medical conditions, an interesting distinction that I didn't really understand, I fear that we'll be at the mercy of counter staff that daily abrogates the rights of people with disabilities the same, who continue to ask the, the same basic question about service animals. No one has the right to ask why you need a plastic straw or why you have a service animal. 
but they surely will. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Deborah Greif. I am the chairperson of the Brooklyn Family Support Service Advisory Council. I'm a parent of a child with disabilities. I am the sibling and a child of a person with disabilities. I am old enough to remember when we only had paper or sometimes the disgusting wax straws. They were disgusting, and I used to remember eating wax and would get very sick at home. And by the time I got home, paper straws kept constantly breaking or they collapsed completely. I gave you a testimony from a Special Olympic athlete, Rodney Hankins, who I happen to be his advocate, rep, and adopted mom. And yes, I'm the coach. They always remind me, I keep forgetting that, I apologize. But this is the things I'm concerned about. I know, I'm on my local community board and we know about recycling. I have not seen you educating society recyclable plastics. How come the, uh, don't you find the restaurants or places of business that don't recycle properly? It's not that hard to recycle plastic straws. Look, my cousin will be testifying a minute. When I go with her, we grab our plastic straws to make sure I get home and I put it in my recycling bin to protect the environment. Why aren't you, it's the law. You can do this, have these bins at the beaches, right by Sheepshead Bay, any places, and educate them from their starting in early intervention, preschool, kindergarten, all the way up. Start teaching everybody, and that includes businesses, on the proper way of recycling. Because this way, persons with disabilities can use the correct straws they need. Now, you say, why do I have a cup here? You see, okay, I can handle this, but have you ever tried to clean a straw? Yeah. This is what's called the special straw bottle brushes. This is over 20 years old. The reason I can still use it is I properly sterilize it. This is also before Amazon came into existence. So everyone says, oh, you can buy it on Amazon. Yeah, right, you can't always, because they send you the wrong size brushes. As you see, there's for the little ones and all these. What do they do? I can appropriately clean the brush, but I have the manual dexterity. My son does not. He has, he has fine and gross motor skill issues. When he was younger, we had to use straws to teach him to drink properly. I didn't want the drinks on, my, on me or my son, especially in the winter. Try having a, a formula on you in the middle of the winter. It's not pleasant. The smell is disgusting. I represent families whose children have texture issues. Some of them can only drink like this. Some need the bendable. And they all need to be considered. Nobody asked us, let me tell you, whenever I've been asked to appear or answer things, anything that will affect people with disabilities, I answer them. I never was contacted, I wish you had, because I would have told you to take the bill out and let us rework it so that we do the proper thing. The businesses are responsible to doing the correct recycling. If I have to recycle at home correctly, because my landlord can fine me, if he gets a fine because I didn't recycle properly, they can do it too. I recycle the straws correctly. So I want everybody else to do it. Thank you. You want to do it? Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Hi. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Am Nino. I am hidden superintendent for the banner of plastic straws. As you can see, I have tremors in my hands. I love vacuums, but I still need plastic straws. I really, I really. Why? Well, as you can see, I have tremors in my head. I cannot hold a cup or drink anything. I use straws to drink my soup, coffee, milk, cereal, and my water. I am old enough to remember paper and wax straws. The paper straws collapse and the wax straws and of you eat them and you swallow them. Yuck. I can't carry plastic straws with me all the time. It doesn't taste good to use the same straw with soup, then you drink water or straw or drink and a coffee or tea. The reason 
permanent place control are very hard for me to clean. And was eating a standard thing, cleaners was for me. If I go to a culture restaurant, the answer is no. They don't clean them. No restaurant recycles the plants and trails correctly. When we are finished eating, when we are finished eating, at home, you recycle. At home, I recycle my place control. Why not have recycling bins, cans, and all intersections? Please, for my sake, do not be in place control. Please, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, I'm Christopher Greif, advocate for people with disability, and as everyone else has been saying, that I agree, I feel like as a disability, my fellow uh, disability people, we feel like we're left out as usual. We are the ones, we voted here, we are the ones use these straws. It is not right to use paper or wax. Paper melt very fast, and it's also dangerous because in high temperatures, they could actually burn some people, or rip fasten in a heartbeat. If I want a milkshake, I can't use it because it's already breaking a piece. And it actually can choke a child's, uh, it can actually, a child can automatically eat that. They can get sick. There are safety cautions. And the gentleman who was here earlier by mentioning about human rights law and ADA law, there's also a safety law too. A, a child or even anyone else in this room can choke on that a paper, or worse, wax. Unfortunately, you may have to pass away because that stuff is toxic. Plastic straws and other materials like this one here, you can't get this in some restaurants. And to clean them, it's a challenge. I'm a little hurt because it would be nice to see our lot of elected officials to really think what they're saying and what they're doing. Because, you know, we're always stuck in the 20th or 19th century. We're in the 21st century. Never asked us what we want from the disability world or the senior world. My other colleagues and my other colleagues and my friends are very hurt and very disappointed because again, we're in the dark or not in the sun because we are not asked what we feel. We are the human beings here too. We are humans, we have a soul, but again, we're always in the dark. Don't ask us anything. We are work very hard also. We're all here, we're advocating, and we're asking you, like even this young lady next to me, Mrs. Menino, has made this very clear. Please do not ban plastic straws. Seriously, because you, 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 you're gonna take them away, that's how is a person supposed to enjoy a milkshake, a cup or a cereal, something to eat, they enjoy. It's not right. And I think you guys need to, instead of rushing it in, th check, first before you shoot the guns at the all of us. We, we ask this, that this, this bill should not go through at all costs. And I hope you please really strongly think about this. Thank you. Thank you. And I wanna, yeah, sorry. I, uh, I'm Joe Rappaport. I'm from the Brooklyn Center for Independence of the Disabled. Um, all I wanted to say is that we appreciated uh, Council Member Rosenthal's uh, comments at the beginning of the hearing, uh, uh, Council Member uh, Landers' uh, com comments as well about now uh, working with the disability community. Uh, that has not happened, obviously, as you've heard, um, and that's why we're here today. Uh, but we're looking forward to working with you, uh, with uh, other council members, with the environmental community, uh, and with the range of uh, the wide range of uh, people in the disability community, so that we can craft a bill that actually makes sense for everyone. Um, doesn't put the onus, um, as Sharon was saying, on people with disabilities, and essentially makes uh, these kinds of straws available to people who need them. The, the other thing I am very concerned about is that it does appear that uh, people do think that they sort of know the answer, who in fact aren't experiencing uh, the problem. Um, and uh, there was a suggestion uh, that in calls that I made uh, to council members uh, and to their aides that, uh, well, other kinds of straws will do, you know, hard plastic or, or something like that. It's not the case. Um, 
there was an offer in testimony earlier uh, from somebody, we'll work to make a straw that can be recycled properly and so on. We're all for, we're all for that, we're all for that, but it, for the moment, uh, for better or for worse, uh, the kinds of straws, the kind of plastic straws that are available now uh, are a lifesaver for many people. Thank you. And, oh, and, and uh, yeah. Edith uh, reminds me that uh, we'll talk about the details, but once the, we believe that there will be a change in the legislation and uh, people have to be made, uh, be informed very clearly uh, that uh, this option uh, exists. If there's a, a, a stack of paper straws, uh, uh, for instance, there has to be uh, a sign or something that indicates that uh, plastic straws are, are available upon request from anyone. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate your testimony and I just want to reassure everyone that we are very sensitive um, to, to your concerns. Uh, we did not have any intention of leaving you out. The bill does say may, but again, it was to, it was, to, it was pointing of trying to making sure that you're not left out of the conversation. And the reason this hearing exists is so that you can be able to give us your input and we can hear from you and make sure we're doing the right thing moving forward. The bill is not being rushed. It's gonna be, it's, it's gonna go through its process and there is time to amend it and make sure there's language that makes sure it takes your testimony into account. Is, is your microphone on? If I may, I know you have a mind that's very apparent, but what you didn't do was call us up like you did the environmental community. You didn't, you didn't have us at the t table at the same time. And we can't, we can't, we have to just stop depending on the council members' intuition about what we need. You need to get us at the table when draft the bills. Fair enough. Thank you. I want to add one thing, Councilman. You need to include us on everything because we, you know, one of the first panel said, oh, we, I want to live in a great city. Well, I'm going to tell you, I'm a lifelong New Yorker. We are not a great city because we're not 100% accessible. Our elected officials very rarely include us in anything unless they say, uh-oh, we maybe broke the ADA law. I'm a child of someone with disabilities, and I remember what my mother told me, how she, what she went to school and what, she was, what was done to her, and she was disabled. It's not fair. It's still continuing, and it has to stop now. You have to include us because we are voters. The day my son turned 18, regardless of his developmental delay, I signed for the, helped him sign for the card for the select services, even though he does not have to serve because of the disability. But he's also a voter, and I, as his parent, made sure that he participates. And I do that for my full council in Brooklyn. I signed up over 400 people at the Family Support Fair in Brooklyn, and these are persons with disabilities. We need to stop being ignored. We are registered New York City voters, and this city needs to be made 100 accessible, and you need to have everybody in the council, whenever anything comes up, you need to call the, access, the committee, the people with disabilities, because we'll tell you if it will affect us or not. We are living it. So please remember that. Thank I hear you, you and you. I'm with you. Um, you. Council, I just want to add one thing, um, because I know SE Councilman Helen, um, Helen Rose was here too. One thing that was once common earlier today was, I think was kind of inappropriate, that you, yes, we only have to worry about the environment, but again, safety is, needs to be remembered because we are the ones have to deal, we have this straw for a reason because it stretches. If you use paper, it rips automatically. It's not easy. 90, at least a lot of us here cannot wholly grab it. I have spasms in my hands. It's hard for me, even when it's cold temperature in this room, it locks my hands into spasm. So it's got, we have to be realistic, people with disabilities and everyone in all five boroughs. And again, I feel like some of our council members, and forgive me, I have to be bloodhound right now, you make a promise, 
you don't keep. There were a lot of electrofishers in the past, maybe one or two or three did, but we're in the 21st century. We need to get out of the old times and let's move on to the new century. Doesn't matter what, who we are, Thank what you. we are. Thank you. Hello. May I, yeah, may I just add real quickly, I'm so sorry I couldn't be here to hear your testimony. Um, I have a couple of staff who have been listening and taking notes for me. I was across the hall, uh, across the way at another hearing where we're talking about model budgeting, um, which is something that I've been working on a lot to make sure that our contracts are fully funded so we take care of people. So it was not my intention to miss this testimony. Um, and I, I did get feedback that Councilmember Espinal has really listened here, and I appreciate him for that. Um, you know, you have council members here today who are saying very, I hope loudly and clearly, um, you know, it is very much part of the legislative process to get feedback just like this and to make sure that it's incorporated before the final bill comes out. So I really appreciate your time and I appreciate council member Espinal very much. Thank you. Thank you. I want to call up Naz Friahi, Leah, the Ariel, Shayla Morat, Youssef Mbaiz, Bliss uh, Beatrago, and Lisa DiCaprio. All right, you may begin. Hello, my name is Sheila Moravati. I'm here with the Crayon Collection. I'm actually um, originally was here in New York City for many years, and now I live in Malibu, and I was one of the people who spearheaded the straw ban in Malibu, the plastic straw ban in Malibu. Uh, the ban went into effect on June 1st and has been extremely successful so far. I do want to mention that we were concerned with larger corporations, and myself and Senator Henry Stern went to Starbucks on the day that the ban went into place, and they have wonderful paper options that do not melt. The newer products last for three hours or more in liquids, and the straws that Starbucks had were both sizes for their larger drinks and, and shorter drinks, and they were green, Starbucks green. So that showed us that there is a solution. These corporations can and will do it, and they're ready to go. So far, we've had no negative response in the city of Malibu. Everyone is on board and wants to do the right thing. Uh, my work, personally, is about finding and shining lights on habits of waste. As I've spent the past few days here in New York City watching people walking the streets with their Dunkin' Donuts cups and the straws, I wonder how they feel about that 15 minutes or 10 minutes that they'll enjoy that drink and knowing that that straw, or probably not knowing that that straw will never leave this planet and ends up in our oceans at a rate of 500 million per day in the United States alone. These straws do not decompose. Fish and other sea life see them as food and then they start to break down into microplastics that then are ingested by our fish and sea life which then we ingest as well and are in our waterways. So I, can, I really hope that the city of New York will set the example for a large city to be able to do this, and I sincerely hope that Los Angeles will follow suit and many other cities. What we saw happen after Malibu was a worldwide ripple effect, and I truly appreciate you all taking the initiative, and Council Member Espinal, thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Leah Doral, and I'm here to testify on the behalf of the Oceanic Global Foundation in support of intro number 936 presented by Councilman Espinal Jr. I would like to begin by expressing my gratitude for the chance to stand before you during this very important event for New York City and this highly visible moment for the rest of the world. The proposed bill has been presented as a restriction or ban of single-use plastic items, particularly straws and stirrers. While this 
while that s certainly is our goal, my hope with my testimony today is to demonstrate that despite the connotation associated with the term ban, eliminated, and restrict, this bill is not proposing a negative or inconvenient outcome. It is rather proposing an opportunity for positive change. It is proposing the opportunity to protect human and planetary health for now and for the future. The opportunity to give individuals, businesses, and corporations the power to make a difference. The opportunity to underscore New York City's role as one of the most influential cities in the world and the opportunity to create a groundswell amongst the cities, states, and countries that follow in its lead. As we have heard this morning and will continue to hear throughout the afternoon, plastic pollution poses an undeniable threat on both human and planetary well-being. It's devastating ecosystems, disturbing food change, threatening animal species, and spreading illness and disease. At this rate, we're currently the, at the current rate that we're consuming plastics, these threats will only expect to increase as newer threats will undoubtedly arise. Nonetheless, I would like to clarify that plastic in itself is not the problem. Plastic is a valuable material that saves lives in medical fields and allows for technical advancements. The problem is the way that we're using the plastic. You've heard that we consume 500 million plastic straws per day in the US alone. A material that is made to last forever is used for 10 minutes, designed to outlive eternity, cycling through our seas, through the fish we eat and the water we drink. It is estimated that 93% of New York City tap water is contaminated with traces of plastic. We have an unnecessary reliance on single-use plastics which stems from convenience, habit, and cost efficiency. While there are people that need this, and there are many opportunities, that, um, there are many different solutions out there, and this is continuously growing very quickly. This is why the environmental community has identified eliminating plastic straws as the first viable step in addressing bigger picture issues related to plastic and to building a more sustainable future for us all. At Oceanic Global, we have not only raised awareness about the problem of the plastic straw, but we've also identified as well as promoted industry-specific solutions that eliminate plastics both easily and in a cost-efficient way. We've developed a free downloadable toolkit entitled the Oceanic Standard that talks readers around the reasoning, the process, the benefits, and the marketing opportunities of going straw-free. Since it launched in May this year, we've signed over 100 restaurants, hotels, nightclubs, bottegas, and corporate offices in moving away from plastic straws to more sustainable alternatives, such as paper, pasta, or hay. We found that by providing solutions um, and moving to, upon a, uh, moving to a straw upon request only policy, businesses have not been, have not only been keen to make this switch, but have also been empowered to tackle the larger initiative. We also found that although these sustainable options can be slightly more expensive, removing straws, unless upon request only, ultimately saves venues money, meeting both business and environmental need. The businesses in the city are a core part of this foundation. We want to continue to support the set their successes as an organization. We have made ourselves a resource available to anyone in the process of making this change. There is a reason that New York City is known as the greatest city in the world. I have mentioned that it is its businesses of all sizes that are part of that reason. But when it comes down to it, it is the people that make the city great. New Yorkers are passionate, they, find for what, they fight for what they believe in, and they take action towards protecting each other and in doing what's right. This is evident by the New Yorkers here in the room that are taking a stance to pass this bill. And will make small change. This will make a small change in New York, but it will create a lasting impact on the rest of the world. Thank you. Thank you, Leah. Appreciate it. I was going to ask everyone. We have a two-minute clock, and we have a lot of people testifying today. So let's try to stick to the clock. Thank you. Sure. Good afternoon, and thanks for having me, Councilperson Espinal. My name is Naz Riahi. I'm the founder and creative director of Bitten, an events series that positions food as a pillar of pop culture and explores, explores the space through the lens of creativity, innovation, technology, art, and fun. 
As such, I've dedicated a great portion of my life to working within the industry, from consulting with large food brands and startups to partnering with chefs and restaurants. The environmental hazard of plastic straws is an issue that's near to my heart. I support the proposition to ban past single-use plastic straws in New York City because I believe the positive impact of such an action is far greater and longer lasting than any short-term challenges. The simple fact is that for most of us, plastic straws and stirrers are not a necessity. The use of straws is a learned behavior. Last year, I decided to try drinking my iced coffee out of a cup. It may sound silly, but I was worried that it would be impossible to walk my dog while carrying an unlidded iced coffee. I don't know if any of you have terriers, but they're little troublemakers. Mine lurches after squirrels and dives for scraps of food as if his life were dependent on it. To my surprise and delight, it was neither impossible nor impractical to carry my iced coffee without a lid and a straw and to drink from the cup. It turns out that this age-old method of putting our mouth on the rim of a cup actually works. For over a year, I have not, not used a plastic straw and have not even found a need for a reusable or compostable straw. To those who may say that their business is dependent on selling drinks with plastic straws, I say there are alternatives. Algae, bamboo, and corn straws are sustainable solutions. If every industry that absolutely needed straws used these alternatives, the economies of scale would drastically decrease the cost. Further, small businesses that use environmentally sound straws offset the cost by offering a straw when a customer asks for one. This is the best long-term solution because it is less wasteful and helps people unlearn an unnecessary behavior. In a time when the future of our country and the world can seem doomed, when impactful positive change seems daunting and impossible, Eliminating plastic straws in New York City is a simple, positive action we can take that will make a huge difference. It can be a source of pride for our community, and it can help New York City continue to establish itself as a progressive, thoughtful city positioned to lead by example. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. My name is Ayana Elizabeth Johnson. I'm a marine biologist and a Brooklyn native. I'm founder and president of the consulting company Ocean Collective. And I'm here to speak in support of intro 936. Watching our plastic pollution problem grow and grow is horrifying. Single-use plastics, straws, bags, bottles pollute our parks and streets and waterways. Globally, a ton of plastic ends up in the ocean every four seconds. I have done this math myself. It's mind-boggling, and it's also one of the easiest environmental problems to fix. I am eager to see my hometown become a true leader in fighting the massive cultural addiction to plastic. We have to get this right. The stakes are high. 83% of drinking water is contaminated, both bottled and tap. Once plastic is in the ocean, it is broken down into smaller pieces by sun and salt. It becomes microplastic, gets incorporated in the food chain. One third of fish are contaminated with microplastic. Oysters and mussels are contaminated. Contamination of seawater itself means there is microplastic in our table salt. We are eating plastic every day and we have no idea what the health impacts will be, but common sense says that it's not good. We use science to create a material that lasts forever and now we throw it away all day, every day. And most of this is single use. There is no away. Every piece of plastic that has ever been created is still with us. People are turning to compostable plastics as the answer, but even these, made from cornstarch turned into durable polymers, can take years or even decades to biodegrade. They need to be put under specific conditions to break down, and New York City does not yet have the infrastructure, the industrial composting facilities, to do this breakdown. So compostable plastics sit in landfill like everything else. It will take much more strong leadership, concrete and ambitious commitments from government to tackle our global plastic epidemic. New York City sets global trends. Our city is a cultural arbiter. If New York steps up, and steps up to lead, it will make a huge difference. Our city is committed to achieving the UN Sustainable Development Goals, which includes the aim to prevent plastic pollution. We have a very long way to go to achieve that goal, but we can start by banning single-use plastic straws, and we certainly must not stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Next. My name is Lisa DiCaprio. I am a professor of social sciences at NYU and the conservation chair of the Sierra Club New York City Group. 
The Sierra Club New York City Group supports Intro 936 2018, which was introduced by Council Members Raphael Espinal, Helen Rosenthal, who represents me in the City Council, and Barry Grudenchik. This is an important initiative to reduce plastic pollution, which includes millions of plastic straws and stirs that cannot be recycled. Cannot be recycled, I think that's an important part to remember. Technically infeasible to recycle. They are not biodegradable, and there are available alternatives. The proposed legislation reflects an increasing global awareness about the destructive impact of various kinds of plastic pollution. Today, plastics represent the most common form of debris in our oceans and the Great Lakes. Single-use plastic straws and stirs comprise more than 7% of plastic products. Plastic straws represent the sixth most common type of litter, and only 1% of these straws are recycled. As related to the National Geographic issue, Planet or Plastic, 18 billion pounds of plastic end up in our oceans every year, and more than 40% of plastics that are produced are only used once and then discarded. In here, I'd like to hold up a photograph of a stork completely encased in plastic in a landfill in Spain, which was only freed and only survived because it was released from this plastic by the photographer. And I highly recommend this issue. Many of you may already have it. You can order it directly from National Geographic, Planet, or Plastic, which is obviously a very appropriate title. As voluntary initiatives are not sufficient, legislation to ban single-use plastic straws is gaining momentum within and outside of the United States. Several cities, as has been pointed out, such as Seattle, Malibu, and Miami Beach, have imposed bans that are now being considered on a statewide level in California and Hawaii. On April 16th of this year, Prime Minister Theresa May announced the formation of the Commonwealth Clean Oceans Alliance, which will focus on eliminating single-use plastics in order to reduce marine pollution. Most recently, on May 28th, the European Commission, which proposes legislation for the EU, announced a directive that, if approved by the EU's 28 member states, will ban several single-use plastic items, such as plastic straws, for which sustainable alternatives are available. In conclusion, in addition to supporting 936-2018, the Sierra Club New York City Group is also advocating for Councilmember Espinal Bill 039-2018 to prohibit the sale or distribution of single-use bottles for commercial purposes at New York City beaches and parks, as well as Councilmember Ben Kalos' Bill 0636-2018 to prohibit the sale or distribution of single-use bottles on New York City property. With these three interrelated bills, the New York City Council is contributing to the global campaign to protect our oceans, which are essential for marine life and the habitability of our planet. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Youssef Mubarez, New York native, uh, Yemeni merchant, and a proud member of the Yemeni American Merchant Association, a nonprofit birthed from the hugely successful bodega strike in 2017 which is a protest of the travel ban. And we're pleased and proud to provide testimony on behalf of our merchants in support of this bill. Um, you heard all the facts, and uh, they're stunning. And we here at the Yemeni American Merchants Association stand behind making a change. In the thousands of corners where the Yemeni American makes a living every day, he is constantly on the lookout for an opportunity to be a force for positive change in New York. And this is what this bill provides for these normal Yemeni American citizens every day. Whether it be their corner, block, or borough, the Yemeni bodega is a staple in their communities and generally the start of each of their community members' day. You grab a coffee, you grab a drink, and they give you a plastic straw. We're here to educate our merchants, our thousands of merchants. One less straw a day from each of them there's a 1,000 straws a day that we can help get rid of in New York. We're here to educate them on alternatives such as paper, bamboo, metal, or glass straws, and make sure they're readily available for their customers, even going as far as suggesting their customers skip using a straw altogether. Uh, Yama is proud to support and partner with the council. We can make a difference, and we will. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, I know we have Bliss who wanted to testify. Want to just jump in there? Then we're going to call the next panel after Bliss testifies. Okay. 
Uh, good morning. Well, good afternoon at this point. <laughs> so my name is Bliss Petrago. I'm the Community Stewardship and Engagement Manager for the Billing Oyster Project. Um, and I'm testifying on behalf of my organization, as well as the countless students, volunteers, donors, academic partners, waterfront communities who make our work possible and meaningful. So New York Harbor was once a robust estuary teeming with over 220,000 acres of oyster reefs. However, by the early 1990s, oysters were functionally extinct due to population or over-harvesting. Today, we are able to work with the New York Harbor School in Governors Island to restore oyster reefs to New York City's waterways. Despite their size, oysters contribute towards water quality, build habitat for many of our marine critters, and help protect our shoreline from major storm surges like Superstorm Sandy. The hundreds of students, teachers, and environmental educators that we work with are passionate about the oyster reefs they're creating with us and the harbor they want to see protected. As they work alongside our team to restore their local waterfront, they're deeply disappointed to witness piles of plastic floatables along their shoreline, which you'll see pictures of in our testimony. As if it weren't bad enough, plastic breaks down into smaller pieces of plastic called microplastics that pose a huge threat to other marine organisms, our own public health, and filter feeders like our oysters. Oysters unintentionally ingest these microplastics while they're feeding, and recent studies have shown that they greatly negatively impact their reproductive rates. Any negative impact on our oyster populations can cause a cascade effect on countless other marine organisms that call New York Harbor home. Organisms like crabs, fish, shrimp, seahorses, probably didn't know we had seahorses, uh, rely on our oyster reefs for food, habitat, and nurseries. We're trying to provide our estuary with the best opportunities to rebuild its underwater community, and microplastics can undo the efforts of our team, our constituents, and our Harbor School students. Today, 70 New York City restaurants sort and collect their oyster shells as part of our shell collection program, and we use those shells as foundations of our oyster reefs. Also, photos in our testimony is you'll see piles of plastic straws in our shell piles, and we look forward to a day when we no longer have to pull those plastic straws out before providing the foundation for our oyster reefs in the New York Harbor. We're committed to supporting our restaurant partners and ending their use of plastic straws and turning to an abundance of other opportunities. Uh, we understand this will be a lifestyle change for all New Yorkers, uh, and we encourage the council members to work inclusively with all New Yorkers to find a solution that keeps the environment and New York City's community safe and healthy. Uh, this le legislation will cause a huge sea of change for the health of New York Harbor and build upon the strong foundation of outreach and awareness that of sustainably minded environmental organizations like many of those that we testify in solidarity today. Thank you. Hey, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Um, next panel, we have um, Robert Sunshine, Andrew Riggi, Robert Bookman, Kevin Dugan, Melissa Chapman, and Gregory G G Giannani. Melissa Chapman? Yeah. Oh, she's here, okay. Got you. You can pull up a chair. Okay. Oh, it's good to be back, thank you. I'm Andrew Riggi of the New York City Hospitality Alliance. We're a trade association that represents uh, restaurants and bars throughout the five boroughs. Um, uh, first, I just wanna, I hope someone from the de Blasio administration is here. I'm very disappointed and quite frankly astonished that that was the testimony of the Department of Consumer Affairs coming out explicitly opposing the legislation to allow restaurants the option of adding a clearly disclosed surcharge to their menu prices, a right that is given to business owners actually everywhere else throughout the state of New York, in Long Island, in Buffalo, in Westchester County, and around the country. Uh, Progressive cities like San Francisco, Seattle, you see restaurants that are adding clearly disclosed surcharges. 
One of the reasons I'm astonished is that we have been working on this for two years with the administration. They've assured us that they are listening to us. And to have them come here and explicitly oppose it, um, like I said, it makes a lot of our city's small business owners uh, kind of feel like it's a slap in the face. So I really want to thank the council for hearing this bill. It is clearly more important than ever. The cost to operate a restaurant in the city has skyrocketed. Uh, you can speak with any local businesses in your district or any of the other members' districts, and you will hear from them that it is getting tougher and tougher to operate a business. Contrary to comments made by uh, the mayor, um, the restaurant industry in many cases is struggling. Employment growth in full service restaurants dropped from average growth of about 7% a year to less than 2%. Uh, the number of licensed establishments from the Liquor Authority has plummeted. Um, and we're really concerned. Many of the restaurateurs, new restaurateurs, existing restaurateurs that have been in the business for a long time have transitioned from full service restaurants that employ a lot more people, where people make a lot of money in tips, to limited service restaurants, or they're just going and operating in other cities. So they really need the opportunity to use this clearly um, disclosed surcharge. Um, that's where it comes in. It's not a fix-all, but it's one tool that's commonly used in all other industries um, that may help some businesses and workers in today's challenging climate. Uh, if restaurateurs believe they, I would hope I could just read this because we're on top of a lot of people. Um, if restaurateurs believe they could just raise menu prices, uh, they would and we wouldn't be having this conversation. But your favorite restaurant did not design consumer purchasing behavior. They were just trying to run a business and employ people, pay taxes, and create nice, exper nice experiences within its confines. Um, if their consumers don't like the surcharge, they won't continue to use it. And as long as the charge is clearly disclosed to the consumer where all menu prices are listed as required by this proposed law, there's nothing deceptive about this practice which leads us to a really important question about the legality of the Department of Consumer Affairs rule in the first place. Uh, the rule is promulgated under the section of the law that prohibits deceptive trade practices. Now, if the surcharge is clearly disclosed, then it's clearly not deceptive. And because surcharges are permitted in all other industries in the city, the rule is also discriminatory towards the restaurant industry. And as the representative of the Department of Consumer Affairs mentioned earlier, over the years, they have issued many interpretation letter letters to the rule, providing multiple different exceptions, except the one that restaurateurs want, which really has basically turned this rule into Swiss cheese and further delegitimizes its standing. So it's clear, however, that if the rule is enacted or this legislation is enacted or the rules repealed, the city would still have the authority and they should have the authority to penalize a restaurant that applies a surcharge without properly disclosing it to a customer. It's important to note this has been an issue of full service restaurants, not one of limited service restaurants, respected business owners throughout the city, especially many of them who sit on the mayor's own food and beverage hospitality council greatly support this, have been pushing for this issue, and they want a surcharge. There's two camps. One, want to use a surcharge of about 3 to 4 percent, where customers will still tip. Some others would like to consider a larger surcharge and potentially move away from a tipping uh, model. This will help reduce the disparity of wages between front of house workers and kitchen workers who are unable or prohibited by law from participating in a restaurant's tip pool. So the change or this legislation will bring greater equity to the workplace. Um, and in both examples, restaurants would independently set the surcharge percentage and business model so it's tailored for their specific needs. In 15 years of doing this work, I haven't seen many issues that have been so important to this. For the past two years, nearly every day I hear from one or more restaurant or bar owners that just want the option to add a clearly disclosed surcharge. So I thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, Council Member Borelli for this bill, and really everyone in the council, and I urge you to get this inappropriate, antiquated rule off the book, and we ask you please support and pass intro 823 and do it soon. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Rob Bookman. I'm counsel to the New York City Hospitality Alliance, Andrew's group. I've also been in private practice for more decades than I care to admit any longer. And prior to that, I was counsel at the Department of Consumer Affairs. So I want to put this in a legal con context. Everybody else here will talk about how important the industry needs it from a, from a business perspective. But let's talk about the law for the moment. 
this bill is designed to correct a longstanding era uh, of a regulation that was adopted in 1974, even before I was at Consumer Affairs, for those of us who aren't good in math, 44 years ago, um, to correct a temporary issue that existed back at the time. There was a spike in meat prices, and restaurants back then, back in the 70s, uh, menus were printed like once a year. There were these big books. Uh, and so because of the spike in, in, in beef prices, menus, uh, restaurants, steak restaurants and others were tacking on on the bill when people got it, a surcharge to accommodate these, this temporary spike in meat, meat prices. So Consumer Affairs was a new agency then. It just started five years earlier. Consumer protection was actually what they were all about, unlike today. And, uh, and so they adopted this regulation to correct that problem. Fast forward to a new era today of 2018 where surcharges are common in, in our society. Uh, they're neither deceptive nor there are they unconscionable. You can't go into a yellow cab without a lawfully uh, approved surcharge. You can't get on an airline without a surcharge. You can't book a, a catered event without an admin fee or a surcharge. The day, it's, it's different from the 1970s. I don't understand their stubbornness in refusing to recognize that. Instead, what they have done over the decades is micromanage the restaurant industry with, and stick with this 1974 rule by keep coming up with more and more exceptions to how when we can put in a surcharge. And since the rule was adopted under the CPL, the Consumer Protection Law, uh, the Consumer Protection Law regulates unconscionable and deceptive trade practices. So in order for them to promulgate a rule under that, the practice has to be unconscionable or deceptive. Clearly it's not deceptive based on the, the way this legislation is written because it would be a clearly disclosed charge on the menu, on the boards, wherever there are prices. Secondly, it clearly cannot be unconscionable because not only does it exist everywhere else in New York where they're not stopping it, but they agree that new restaurants can do it, but only under micromanaged circumstances of eight people or more, you're splitting a bill. They've decided when it's okay for a restaurant to add a surcharge. That's not within the purview of the consumer protection law. It's either unconscionable and deceptive or it's not. By their own testimony and by the questions of, of Councilman Powers, it became clear that it is neither unconscionable nor, nor is it deceptive. Finally, their, their, their testimony about consumer uh, being confused, you know, if there was a surcharge. Well, by that logic, then they should bring charges against Macy's and, you know, for having 20% off sale. Uh, because if they said consumer can't figure out what uh, a 20% surcharge might look like, well then how could they figure out what a 20% discount is like? But clearly we are, we are, they under the consumer protection law allow every store to do a sale and the sale is a percentage and the consumers still have to figure it out. So it's neither unconscionable nor deceptive. And if, if consumers are that credulous, that they can't figure it out, then they should probably outlaw $9.99 for any item as well, because it's really $10, and the reason why it's $9.99 is because people believe that that's a lot less than $10. Uh, we're here to protect the average consumer. This bill does that. It, it, it allows restaurants to do in New York City what we're allowed to do everywhere else in the world, and that is have a clearly disclosed char surcharge. If restaurants don't want to do it, they won't do it. If they do it, then people don't like it. They'll vote with their feet. Their feet? Their feet. They'll vote with their feet, and they'll, they'll go to a restaurant that doesn't do it. The council needs to clarify this issue once and for all, protect this industry, allow us to be competitive, and this legislation does it. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Kevin Dugan, and I am the Director of Government Affairs for the New York State Restaurant Association, uh, a trade group that represents food and beverage establishments both here in New York City and throughout New York State. Uh, intro 823 would go a long way to improving the business climate for many, owner, for many owners as it provides them with a much needed economic tool. Uh, therefore, we applaud Councilman Borelli and, and Chairman Espinal for introducing this important legislation and having this hearing today. Allowing restaurants to incorporate a surcharge structure would allow them to offset costs and bring pay equity to their operations. As businesses continue to fight uphill against an ever-increasing cost, uh, it, it is many of the employees that work in the kitchens that suffer. These employees are currently not allowed to take part in any kind of tip pool due to the New York State Department of Labor law, 
While other employees have the ability to supplement their income through tips, these workers do not. This forces them to rely solely on the hourly wage the employees can afford to pay them, and with dollars becoming increasingly stretched, back-of-the-house employees are forced to go longer with seeing any kind of increase. By allowing restaurants to institute an administrative fee or surcharge, owners would be, owners would be able to bring an additional income to these workers and give these workers raises uh, that they so richly deserve. Uh, 1974, the New York State Department of Consumer Affairs, as Rob just touched on, implemented a rule that prohibits restaurants from adding certain types of charges to their menus. This original intent of the rule was to protect consumers against unfair practices, um, which was uh, which was a result of a beef shortage at the time. Um, clearly, these issues are no longer prominent and further consumer protection laws have been established. Uh, simply put, the current law that prohibits this practice is out of date and no longer serves the purpose it was created for. No longer do customers have to worry about being charged a price that differs from what they see on the menu. Over the last few years, we have continually made this point to the New York City Department of Consumer Affairs and we, have still, and we still have yet to see any progress made in getting this law changed. Every other corner of the state allows restaurants to operate with this type of fee of surcharge. This simply isn't fair. Uh, we agreed that any surcharge or administrative fee needs to be fully disclosed on any menu or menu board in a clear, conspicu conspicuous manner. Uh, New York City restaurants are being forced to operate at a disadvantage due to a rule that no longer fits the purpose it was set out to fulfill. We urge the City Council to correct this mistake and pass this needed leg legislation. In conclusion, the New York State Restaurant Association supports Intro 823 and urges the Council to look for further ways to assist the businesses that call this city home. We look forward to working with the Council in future bills that touch also touch on this area. Thank you. Good afternoon, Council Members. My name is Melissa Chapman, and I'm the Senior Vice President for Public Affairs of the Brooklyn Chamber. I'm delivering testimony on behalf of Rick Russo, our Acting President. The Brooklyn Chamber of Commerce is an economic development organization with over 2,000 active members. The bills being considered today will directly impact the local business community that we serve, and so we're very appreciative of the chance to provide feedback. We are supportive of Intro 823 that would allow surcharges um, in restaurants. Uh, the cost of doing business as well as new compliance requirements are increasing in our city and oftentimes operators are unable to keep pace with unexpected ex expenses. In the Brooklyn Chamber's 2017 member issue survey, our members highlighted specific obstacles to doing business in New York City, such as the high cost of providing health insurance to employees and finding affordable uh, real estate, and also 29% of our members identified government regulation, fines, and fees as a problem. These challenges can have cripple, a crippling effect on a restaurant's ability to remain in business, as well as hire and retain employees. Allowing restaurants to implement a surcharge will have a meaningful impact in offsetting rising operational costs so that they can keep their doors open and create job opportunities. We're also supportive of Intro 963, nine which would see a ban on the use of uh, plastic and plastic beverage straws and stirrers. Earlier this month, the Brooklyn Chamber surveyed our members um, on this bill, and 81% of them supported it. We believe that the enactment of this legislation will address serious environmental concerns related to plastic pollution, which is very harmful to marine life. However, Educational outreach by relevant enforcement agencies before and after the law takes effect will be very important in helping these businesses to be in compliance and to avoid related fines or vo for violations. We recommend the use of the city's Chamber on the Go program in each borough so that businesses can receive the information without having to leave their businesses. Thank you for the opportunity to testify as it relates to these matters. Councilman Espinal, again, we thank you for the opportunity to speak. It's unfortunate that we're near the end of the uh, hearing as we have to rush through our testimony. Uh, I've submitted a uh, written testimony. I hope that the committee gets to read it. Um, our group is the uh, National Association of Theater Owners of New York State. We represent in the state hundreds of theaters, and in New York, we represent about 40 theaters. Um, we oppose this well-intended legislation for several reasons. Uh, number one is cost. Although cost has been mentioned several times during the course of this hearing, no one has really stated how much additional money it would cost. We have uh, done a lot of research in this area, and at this point now, uh, using straws uh, that would be biodegradable are uh, somewhere in the area of eight to 10 times as much as plastic straws. 
Um, I just got back from a convention that we run in Barcelona, and for the first time, Coca-Cola, who's one of our sponsors, used paper straws. Well, I think you can imagine what a paper straw and a cup of Coca-Cola for two hours, when you're looking at a movie, what happens. Um, they shrink up, they shrivel, um, it's tough. Um, just like other industries, we face rising costs in the city of New York, film rental, rent, different taxes, different permits, and this is just gonna add additionally to the cost of a ticket. One of our larger circuits in the country did a pro forma across the entire country if they had to switch to paper straws, and it will cost them approximately $4.8 million. The second reason is the suitable alternatives to plastic straws, they're just not available at this time. Again, we've researched it. Uh, the straws that we need in our theaters are at least 10 and a half inches up to 12 inches, depending upon what the drink is, whether it's a icy or a frozen drink. We cannot find straws that big at this time. Uh, we need more time. So if this law goes into effect and it's for 180 days, uh, we, we would urgently request that we have a period of two years to research this and get the manufacturing in place. And finally, um, a different approach, uh, approach for this would be voluntarily offering a straw upon request, and this is happening in many jurisdictions right now, rather than just putting it in the soda. So if the ban is adopted as law, we urgently request that there be a two-year delay in enforcement so that we can be prepared and abide by the law. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Well, thank you all. Appreciate all your testimony. I've got to run. Can I give you two seconds comments on the other two bills so I don't have to wait for the next to be called uh, again? Sure. Sure. I completely support your uh, tobacco correction bill. Um, I represent a lot of small business owners. That was an unintended consequence of the package that the, that the council passed. There are a handful. Notice I noticed the health department didn't say how many. Um, anecdotally, I don't think there's more than a handful of businesses that were previously licensed to sell tobacco products but did not need the New York City license because they didn't sell cigarettes. Now they're caught up in that and they can't get the cigarette license. They can't get the tobacco license. It's not fair. Putting people out of business. Um, so that's my comment on that. I think, you, I think it's correct. And, on, and I just want to add a comment again to reiterate what our, our industry you know, on, you know, on the straws is limiting it just to the health department is really not addressing the problem. Uh, it's nice to see that Bodega Association, you know, the Emmy Bodega Association was here. It's very nice. They're not under this bill. The Bodegas aren't, re aren't licensed by the New York City Health Department. They're licensed by the Department of Ag and Markets, as are uh, 7-Elevens, you know, and, and, you know, and supermarkets, you know. So if you really want to have an impact here and you want it to be fair to everyone, then you take it out of Health Department, who could only license, who only regulate their own businesses, put it under DEP, and make it all businesses that have straws, um, you know, and then you really are having an impact. Otherwise, it, you know, it, it, it's very minimal, and we also, you know, trust DEP more than we trust the health department. <laughs> All right, thank you. Appreciate it, guys. Thank you. Uh, I want to call up the next panel. We have James uh, Sternlicht from Oceanic Global, Emily Kane from Lonely Whale, Jose Sagard from the Waterfront Alliance, uh, Adita Bernkrant from Nyklas. I also want to uh, uh, notably mention we were joined by our new director of nightlife, Ariel Pallets, who's here listening in, our new night mayor. Whenever you're ready, may begin. For me to go? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, all right. Hello, everyone. My name is Emmy Kane, and I'm here testifying on behalf of Lonely Whale in support of intro number 936 presented by Councilman Espinel Jr. Uh, one metric ton, that is how much plastic enters our ocean every four seconds. 2050, that is the year in which there will be more plastic in our ocean than fish by weight. These statistics are scary and seemingly insurmountable with evidence of plastic pollution and our role in its destruction growing each day. So how do we, citizens and business owners, help protect our ocean, help protect the safety and security of the tap water our children drink, which we know is already riddled with microplastic? At Lonely Whale, we believe in the power of market leadership, of celebration, and the positive chain reaction of starting with just one thing, 
<coughs> One year ago, we aimed to kickstart this positive chain reaction with a challenge to stop sucking on plastic straws. Within four months of launching this social media challenge, we saw 304 uh, million organic impressions on social with challenges accepted in over 25 languages from celebrities and social influencers around the world and championed by the United Nations Environment Program's Executive Director Eric Solheim. Since our movement for a starless ocean, supported by over 50 ocean health NGOs, including Oceanic Global, represented here today, has been embraced by countless more individuals, corporations, including Alaska Airlines, Coachella Music Festival, the Marley Family, Live Nation Entertainment, and countless others. Uh, and governments around the world have also taken action. Since we released a toolkit to empower these corporations and also individuals to take action within their establishments and communities, ensuring that once they embrace this movement, they were not alone in their action, but instead part of something much larger than themselves. Today, Councilman Espinal Jr.'s bill is positioned to further the efforts of the global conservation community in this critical first step towards a larger global chain reaction led by New York City. Straws are just one of many single-use plastic items that contribute to the growing amount of plastic waste entering our ocean, an estimated 4 to 12 million metric tons every year, but a critical one we view as a gateway plastic to addressing this issue at scale. Just this May, Dr. Marcus Erickson, co-founder of the Five Gyre Institute and leading researcher on microplastics, led a team of scientists on a two-hour trip on the East River to document microplastic pollution plaguing the water surrounding Manhattan. During the 20-minute trawl, Marcus and his team found three drinking straws. While three straws might not sound like an overwhelming discovery, these straws found in a small stretch of the East River represent the much larger plastic pollution crisis plaguing the waters surrounding New York City. Marcus and his team estimate there could be as many as 130,000 plastic straws floating in the waterways around Manhattan in both the East River and Hudson. At Lonely Well, we recognize we can't solve this problem alone, and it cannot be overstated that this movement must be diverse and inclusive. It is critical that we recognize and lift up the voices of our allies in the disability community and those that are underserved. We need all voices, all industries, on all communities to come together in support of this important first step to protect our environment and ultimately ourselves. Today, New York City has the op opportunity to demonstrate bold leadership and join the movement for a starless ocean. That is why on behalf of Lonely Whale, I am honored to stand alongside the leaders present here today in supporting Councilman Espinal Jr. and Intro 936. <clears throat> I can go. My name is Adita Bernkrant, and I'm the executive director of NICLAS, an animal advocacy and political action nonprofit organization with supporters and activist chapters in all five boroughs, and I'm a resident of Queens. We commend Councilmember Espinal for his leadership on this incredibly important initiative. This legislation acts on the philosophy of acting locally and thinking globally, positioning New York City as a leader by taking historic steps to protect our environment. 500 million plastic straws are used every day in the US. That's enough straws to circle the earth 2.5 times. And it takes up to 200 years for a plastic straw to decompose and they can't be recycled in most places. I've done many beach cleanups here in New York City and the amount of straws that are collected in just one day is staggering. According to a 2016 report by the World Economic Forum, if we don't take action by 2050, there will be more plastic in the ocean than fish. According to the report, titled The New Plastics Economy, the worldwide use of plastic has increased 20-fold in the past 50 years and is expected to double again in the next 20 years. Intro 936 is a powerful step to help combat this systematic problem. In addition to being an, an environmental hazard, plastic straws are also harmful to animals, going so far as contributing to the deaths of significant populations of marine life. For uh, many of you have seen the heartbreaking footage of marine biologists painfully removing plastic straws from the noses of turtles. Turtles are just some of the animals injured or, or killed by plastic straws and other plastics. Marine life varying from plankton to pilot whales are being poisoned by plastic that ends up in our waterways. Each year, one million seabirds and 100,000 marine animals die from ingesting plastic. Other cities and entire countries are on the way to banning plastic straws, and more and more companies are making the switch to plastic straw alternatives, including McDonald's, Ikea, SeaWorld, and Royal Car Caribbean, which all recently announced their intention to phase out plastic straws. Biodegradable or reusable alternatives, um, such as paper, bamboo, metal, or glass, are readily available, and passing intro 936 will help ensure that they become even more widely available. New Yorkers can feel empowered that they are doing their part to help achieve plastic-free oceans one sip at a time. NICLAS therefore supports this legislation, and we commend Councilmember Espinal for his leadership. 
Thank you, and good afternoon. Um, I'm Jose Sogard, Director of Policy and Programs for Waterfront Alliance, a nonprofit civic organization working to restore and revitalize our uh, New York Harbor and waterways. I'll read a brief summary of, uh, of our written statement. Waterfront Alliance strongly supports Intro 936 as part of the wider effort to remove harmful plastic pollutants from our waste stream, which cause disproportionate impact to our waterways and marine habits, as we've heard throughout the afternoon. Many plastic products, including single-use plastic straws, are carried through storm sewers and into our local rivers and onto our coastlines. This bill is an important step toward improving the health of our waterways, both for the people that use and enjoy the water and the aquatic species that call our shared waters home. And I want to emphasize that it's not just the oceans, but it's the waterways right here in New York City. And people are using those waters, again, as a vital resource for recreation and education. Thanks to progress spurred by the Clean Water Act, many of our waterways are once again clean enough for regular recreational use. And we've made significant progress on that front. This has brought more and more New Yorkers onto and into the water, from paddling and sailing to fishing and oyster monitoring. And according to a survey we conducted last year, the growing community of volunteer-led, human-powered and non-motorized boating organizations put more than 100,000 people on the water at no cost at more than 25 locations. Above all, single-use plastic straws cause unnecessary disproportionate harm relative to their benefit. And as we've heard this afternoon, they are effectively non-recyclable. For most, but crucially not all, New Yorkers, plastic straws are a convenience rather than a necessity. We recognize that people with disabilities may require straws for drinking water or other beverages, and we fully support efforts to ensure that this legislation does not place undue burdens on New Yorkers with disabilities. New York must be a leader in this global challenge. We join environmental advocates in urging the New York City Council to pass this legislation and substantially reduce the use of single-use plastic straws here in New York. Thank you for the opportunity to present this testimony. Um, hello, my name is James Sternlicht. I'm direct. Uh, hey, um, my name is James Sternlicht. I am director of development for Oceanic Global, um, which is an, an NGO working to empower people to make better choices in their consumption behaviors and also aid businesses in, the, in that regard. Um, we've heard a lot today about the numbers. The numbers are staggering. I don't think they need to be repeated again. You know, as Amer Americans, we're using so much plastic and so many plastic straws that we don't need to be using that getting rid of this waste is a no-brainer. We do need to also be inclusive. And part of the way that our great American economy responds to challenges like having straws or people needing straws and not being able to use plastic straws is to create these solutions. We work with, at Oceanic Global with a number of, of for-profit solution providers and non-profit solution providers to work on how to structure those solutions. So a large part of what we do actually helps lower the cost basis of making the change for businesses and helps find new solutions for those who need them. And to that end, we believe that Support and support, moving towards this bill is a step not only in the right direction, but a step that will lead to more flexibility for the disabled community as well as the American people and our global, our global family. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks for testifying. So um, there, we're, we're testifying here on three different issues. Um, we do have a lot of folks signed up to testify in the plastic straws, but just for a check, who's here for um, restaurant surcharges, okay. And who's here for um, the re tobacco retailers? Okay, so let's let's go with the tobacco retailers. Um, we have Robert Vitali, Michael Diavoli, Robert Edmonds, Spike Bam Bambian. You may begin. Oh, 
Good afternoon, Chair Espinal and members of the Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing Committee. My name is Robert Edmonds of Edmonds & Company. I'm testifying today on behalf of Davidoff of Geneva, which operates three retail locations in New York City, recently affected by the 2017 tobacco sale regulations. I'm here today testifying in support of Intro 965. Last year, an expansive set of tobacco legislation was passed by the New York City Council and signed into law by Mayor de Blasio on August 28, 2017. Intro 965 is a technical amendment necessary to address a failure of notice to a small and specific subset of tobacco retailers, those that do not sell cigarettes or vaping devices and did not hold cigarette licenses. Prior to the passage of these new laws, cigar retail establishments that did not sell cigarettes were never required by the New York City Department of Consumer Affairs to hold a license in order to lawfully sell cigars. Cigar retail establishments not engaged in the sale of cigarettes were only required to comply with the New York State registration and licensing requirements to sell cigars. One of the new laws, Local Law Number 146 of 2017, updated the New York City retail license for selling cigarettes to encompass all types of tobacco, specifically including cigars. As a result of this law, all tobacco sellers were required to file an application for a license as a cigarette retail dealer prior to February 24, 2018. If a tobacco seller in New York City failed to file the cigarette retail dealer application prior to February 24th, it would effectively be barred from doing business in New York City. There are several cigar-only retailers in New York City that sell cigars but do not sell cigarettes or vaping devices, presumably because they were not previously required to be licensed by the city, they were not on the notice ra radar. These retailers received no notice of the new law or of the severe consequences of missing the deadline. The proposed bill would act to remedy this technical oversight and allow a specific and small subset of tobacco retailers the opportunity to apply for the requisite city license and to continue their businesses in New York City. This bill requires that one, the retail dealer was validly and currently licensed by New York State prior to February 24, 2018 to sell tobacco products at retail, and two, the retail dealer was not required to hold a license by New York City prior to February 24, 2018. These requirements will limit the pool of potential applicants to exclude any tobacco retailers selling cigarettes prior to this date and to exclude any new cigar retailers established following this date. In addition, the bill limits the application period to 180 days following its passage. Without this technical amendment, the three Davidoff of Geneva stores and the few others similarly situated would be forced to close their retail locations in New York City despite their full compliance with all New York State and all New York City laws for many, many years in each case. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, New York City Council committee, Council committee members. My name is Spike Babayan. I have been here many, many times over the past few years. I am here representing today as a regional representative for the New York State Vapor Association. Um, we represent hundreds of business owners in New York State and about 60 or 70 in New York City. These people own vapor shops. The vapor shops do not sell cigarettes. We do not sell tobacco, we do not sell cigarettes. So in relation to this bill, we don't necessarily oppose it, we don't necessarily support it. However, we would strongly encourage you to understand what the laws that were passed have done to our businesses. As a business owner in New York City, I grew to over five locations with my own vape shop over the last seven years. All five are here in New York City, one in Brooklyn, one in Queens, and three in Manhattan. All five of my shops will be closed in two years. I will have to fire 13 employees, including myself and my partner, over the next two or three years because of this law. It does not permit a vape shop to move its e-cigarette license within the same district. We understand that the cap by attrition has to lower the number of tobacco shops. The intent of, of lowering the tobacco licenses is to help people to stop smoking. Well, I have helped 10,000 people stop smoking in the last eight years. And I dare any, anyone else to be able to say that. My employees have helped 10,000 plus people stop smoking over the past eight years. 
and all of my shops will be closed in two years because of this law. Two of my landlords found out that I can't move my license for e-cigarettes. They said, you have an e-cigarette license and you cannot move. So guess what? Next year, your lease ends and your rent is going to be $1,000 higher. <laughs> it, they're extorting money out of me because they know I have no choice. I have to close or I have to pay it. I am not going to lose my businesses. I'm not going to fire my employees. That's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. I have tried over the last two years. I was here presenting on this same issue and begged the council to please allow us to move our license within the same district, not open a new store, not get a new license, move our license within the same district. One of my stores had a flood. It was almost irreplaceable. They almost had to shut down and, and wipe out the whole building. I waited four months for them to open back up again. If there's a fire in one of my stores, if there's a flood, if my landlord crushes the building, I have no business. We have helped 10 thousand New Yorkers and New Jersey and Connecticut and tri-state area people get off of cigarettes. Do not force us out of business by not allowing us to move our stores. By acts of God, by reasons of landlords being jerks, <laughs> by every other reason that will make us absolutely unable to continue business in New York City. Please. I have begged for meetings with every one of my five council members for my five stores, and only one out of five met with me. And you know what their answer was to me? I'm sorry, we can't help you. Good luck. That was the answer. So I should just close all five of my stores? It's not acceptable. And I am begging any council member who hears this testimony, even they're all, though they're all gone, to please reach out to us. I've provided my testimony in writing. Please do something to help me. I just sent another letter to Commissioner Bassett begging for a meeting. And my, the answer was, she has no interest in meeting with you. I, when my, my main store, I got an answer from my council member saying the exact same thing. He has no interest in meeting with you. Someone has to be interested in saving the jobs of my employees and my businesses. It's not fair. I am a female minority, and I have a small business that I have grown for seven years, and I am not going to fire all of my employees because no one will let me change my address on my license. It's not acceptable. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Thank Both you. Of you. I want to call up Vittorio Ant Antonini, Jeremy Marin, Ben Schneider, Burak Kar Karakum, Adam Johnson, Kevin Dillon, John uh, Brustein. You may begin. The sooner the better, guys. <laughs> Five oh, and my name is John Bluestein. I was born in Flushing, New York, and I've stayed here uh, my entire life. Uh, I've opened 12 full-service restaurants over the last 25 years. Um, I never imagined that local full-service restaurants like mine would find ourselves in such a critical and frightening position. Now, Andrew Ridgey really said everything I have to say, but I really feel it. And a lot of my uh, people in my industry do also. A lot of my friends do who are here or, or are not here. I call them. I said, what are you going to do at the end of the year when the minimum wage for tipped workers and other workers go up? And they say, I have no blank an idea. And these are very smart, very talented guys. Um, restaurant payroll is the most important controllable cost we have. It's not rent. It's not food and beverage. It's payroll every time. We watch it like hawks. That control was taken away from us a couple of years ago. So we've had to scramble to think of what to do. And Everything we've done has made a dent. So 
uh, we certainly need the administration support, and now more than ever, uh, to get this optional disclosed surcharge permitted. The law that uh, Andrew talked about is obviously outdated and just simply needs to be fixed. It seems like an easy fix. We find ourselves in a desperate situation. In only three years, the tipped wage has increased 100% and the minimum wage has increased 72%. Other counties get seven years to, to ramp up to that and it's not even $15 in many cases. Uh, I guess, uh, Albany thought New York City would just, New York City restaurants would just raise their prices. That was the assumption. That can't be done. It hasn't been done and it won't be done. You can only raise it so much. We raise it every year as much as we can simply to gather, cover other costs. Uh, this is an incredible and stunting cost. I don't know what company increases wages like this uh, that could survive. Uh, I closed two restaurants last year that were marginally profitable because of the increase in the wage would make them incredibly unprofitable. I have uh, friends who closed two last year and have closed two this year. They're desperate for this surcharge. Um, many of us have added a million dollars or more to our payroll. I certainly have uh, over the last couple of years. For every million dollars in payroll, you have to add eight to $10 million in sales to cover that. It simply can't be done. We don't have magic wand to say, otherwise we would have done it already. Uh, so we cannot cover the cost. And so the money that's lost, it's a direct cost. We get absolutely no benefit from it because the servers do what they do, the bussers, the runners, the guys in the kitchen. There's no change. It's a pure s spend of cash. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to have to enforce the clock now only because it's a matter of time. So, uh, we, Can I, I just say you. one thing, one last thing? So uh, Red Robin is a national chain of 538 stores. In one day, they laid off all their bussers. Every single one was laid off because of this, this problem with the ramp up of the wages and getting no assistance. Uh, we're the only, New York State allows it, New York City should allow it. Thank you. Hi, my name is Vittorio Antonini. I run and own La Lantena di Vittorio at 129 McDougal Street. Unlike the gentleman here, I have one restaurant. I was born into it. My parents started it. I took over when I was 20 years old, and I've been running it for the past too many years. Uh, I felt the need to come here and speak because as a small operator, for all the reasons cited by all the other speakers, I'm not going to repeat everything, but the fact that I came down here to speak and felt the need to come down here to speak is, is a testament to how important I think it is that we ban or that we lift the ban on adding an administrative charge. When you consider legislation or uh, 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 rules, you need to look at what the consequences are and whether they serve the public good. I believe in the $15 minimum wage increases. I believe in a living wage. It just doesn't make any sense to not allow a restaurant to add a clearly, clearly marked and, uh, uh, and, uh, and, and, and delineated administrative charge that doesn't serve the common good. And it just seems to be an example of government overreach. I understand that we need to protect the consumer, but the restaurants who are in business and who, who remain in business are in business because they know how to treat their customers. They would not get away with deceiving customers. This is a place where the government doesn't need to be. And I'll leave it at that because we're late and you guys are tired. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name's Ben Schneider. I'm the owner along with my wife, Sohi Kim, of the Good Fork Restaurant in Red Hook, Brooklyn, a little restaurant. I'm here today in support of this initiative uh, to allow restaurants to use surcharges. When my wife and I opened the Good Fork 12 years ago, we did so with a great deal of enthusiasm, but a small amount of capital and an even smaller amount of knowledge about business and restaurants. We were very naive. But somehow we managed to make a special place that has meaning in the lives of many of our customers, our employees, and, and, and we've created a family. And along the way, we've also managed to learn a little bit about business. 
money in, money out, food costs, fixed costs, labor costs, etc. Restaurants are a notoriously small margin business. I have a metaphor for it. It's like the ocean. All this money washes up on shore, then it washes back out, and there's a little foam left on the beach, and that's what you make. Well, the, the waves are still big, but the foam is getting harder to get a hold of. It's disappearing. When we opened, skirt, skirt steak was three seventy-five a pound. Now it's $10 a pound. But here's the important thing. The tipped minimum wage was $4 a pound. Uh, $4 a pound, sorry. The tip minimum wage was $4 an hour. Now it's eight seventy, dollars and it's going up you know, more and more every year. OK, it's the second part. That's the important part. I fully support an increase in the minimum wage. I would like it to be more. If I could, I would make it $17 an hour right now. But the problem is not in the minimum wage, it's the tip minimum wage, because that's where it gets complicated. The tip minimum wage is intended to ensure that tipped workers in businesses that don't generate high tips will achieve the minimum wage overall. This is important. I believe in that. However, in New York City, in, most, in a large portion of the restaurants, tipped workers are already earning well above the minimum wage in tips. They're earning three or four times the minimum wage. And please know, I value my servers very much, and I want them to do financially well. I love them. They're part of our family. But I also want cooks and dishwashers to be paid better. OK, that's the problem right here. Right now, the average wage for a line cook is like $30,000 a year. You can't live in New York. We can't find cooks. It's, they're just not getting paid enough money. So here's the problem. If, if we raise our prices, OK, in order to compensate for this tip minimum wage, it doesn't even generate quite enough to then throw some to the back of the house. And it also then increases the tips for the front of the house. Because if the check is higher, the 20% of that check is then higher. So it's a continual win-win-win for front of the house and a lose-lose-lose for the back of the house. This surcharge is a smart and nuanced way to deal with that, barring a more nuanced tip minimum wage law. And I have ideas about that if you want to hear them. I mean, there could be a threshold. I'll set it at $25 an hour. If my servers make $25 an hour in tips, then I'm not responsible for the tip minimum wage. And it could be on credit card tips alone, which are entirely trackable. But I don't know if this kind of a nuance, uh, I feel like that the, the government is going in a direction of just wanting us, sort of forcing us in this sort of uh, not graceful way to get rid of tips. And it's not a conversation, and it doesn't work. So that's what I have to say. Good job. Uh, almost good evening. Uh, my name's Kevin Dillon, and I run um, uh, Kevin Dillon. I came up for Kevin Dugan earlier, but I heard it incorrectly from the back. Um, I'm the Chief Operating Officer at Quality Branded Restaurants. We own and manage nine full-service restaurants here in the city. Can you not hear me? Okay. Uh, I fully support this initiative which would allow restaurants like ours to add an operational surcharge on dining checks. This is a practice that is allowed throughout the country, including the rest of New York State, not being allowed to use a surcharge in New York City where we face one of the most competitive landscapes to run a restaurant in the entire country simply makes no sense to me. In the past several years, the cost of running a restaurant in New York City has skyrocketed. Rents have increased, minimum wage has gone up, food costs have risen. The re result is that restaurants are closing in unprecedented numbers and that, they remain, and that they remain open to having to find creative ways to drastically cut costs in attempts to combat the increased costs that we're all faced with as restaurant operators. So far, we've raised menu prices, we've designed new service systems that require few fewer employees to execute, laid off employees resulting in adjusting menu offerings to make them feasible with a leaner staff, changing our whole feel and look of our restaurants to make things more, you know, easier on ourselves to create profits for people, our partners, et cetera, and so forth. But we're still struggling, and we're simply trying to put New York City restaurants in an even playing field with restaurants in other cities from across the country. They're unable to, they are able to put in a uh, finance charge that we would also like to do. Um, if we were to put in an administrative fee, we would fully and clearly disclose this on our menus, put it on our website, and put it at the bottom of every check. For more than two years, the restaurant industry in New York City has been urging the mayor to allow restaurants to have the option of including clearly to close surcharges on the menus. We ask that the City Council help us because we're desperate and need this very, very much. Thank you. Um, my name is Adam. Press the button on the mic. 
Hi, my name is Adam Johnson. I'm the COO of uh, Red Hook Lobster Pound. I'm here to speak for Susan Povich, who is the owner of Red Hook Lobster Pound. Uh, she's got a written statement here, but given the, the time allowed, I'm going to kind of summarize. Um, <coughs> kind of the, the, the key takeaways here are we're, we're looking for a palatable way to, to increase um, some to increase our, our sales to help pay the back of the house and the front of the house. And as some people have talked about, adding those to menu prices, as was noted earlier, um, it definitely affects the way that customers look at the perceived value of the food, even if the, at the end of the day, the price paid is the same. And uh, we are greatly concerned that rising raising the price of our food any more than it is, which you know, the cost of our food have gone up over 100%. Um, rising it any more is going to uh, greatly impact the way that customers uh, view uh, the value of our food. And again, we're, looking, we're not looking to, to screw customers over, and we believe that adding a surcharge is to the, onto the menu is going to be very, um, visible way for them to see that we want where this money is, uh, how much this money is going to be um, at the same time and allowing us to not increase the prices on the menu to the point where people are getting sticker shock uh, and hopefully uh, well, that kind of that extra money will allow us to to pay again the back of the house employees a little bit more and uh, where the front of the house employees are making over $45 an hour in many cases. Even busters and runners at our location are making them in the $22 plus range. Thank you. If any, of all, if any of you all have testimony, you can submit it for the record. Like yeah, I'll submit that as well. All right, thank you. Hi, my name is Keith Trayball. I'm the president of E Squared Hospitality. We own multiple restaurants in New York City, and we support allowing restaurant surcharges. Over the past 14 years, since the opening of our flagship restaurant, BLT Steak, I have witnessed seismic shifts in the industry that have forced us into survival mode. The cost of running a restaurant in New York City has skyrocketed. Over the last three years, our, on our flagship in 57th Street, the rent has tripled. In the last three years, there have been eight wage hikes, with a ninth one on the way. Employee health care is dramatically increasing. Food costs are escalating. We've been forced to cut hours for employees, lay off others. We've reduced the size of our menu to limit the kitchen payroll. Our dessert menu and our pastry department are the latest casualties. They're gone. We've limited the server support staff, eliminating, uh, not eliminating, but almost eliminating bussers and runners. And we've cut hostess shifts to try and maintain service standards. We've raised our menu prices to the limit of what the market will bear, but those increases in the gate are negated by the fact that the average guest is ordering less and spending the same amount before the increases. An administrative fee is needed to offset our, in costs, uh, our increase in costs of doing business. By allowing a prominently disclosed administrative fee, we can hope to generate the necessary revenue and stay in business and hopefully grow that business. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Thanks for your testimony. Appreciate it. Thank you all. All right, we have 17 more folks who want to uh, testify on the plastic straw bill. Um, and just for a matter of time, we're going to lower the clock to uh, one minute. Um, we have Catherine Skopik, Brad Gallagher. Are we still here? Catherine Skopik, Brad Gallagher, Eric Goldstein, Katrina Thomas. Joyce Friedman, All right. Jessica Roth, Jessica Roth, Elizabeth um, Mellet from uh, Eatery USA, Elizabeth, Daniel Joseph, Christine Dimmick, Roy Clavin. I guess we don't have 17 people. 
<laughs> yeah, we'll give you two minutes. Chad Arnold. Ayana Johnson. Andrea De DeVoe. Aria DeVoe. Andrea Aria DeVoe. Change it back to two minutes. Bill Levy. Elizabeth Murray. Debbie Lee Cohen. And Sabrina Sophia. All right, that's it. We'll keep it at two minutes. Yeah. I'll do one more check after this panel, but I think that's it. Is th did you submit? Okay, good. Yeah, have a seat. Did you Your name? Malios? And you're speaking on which bill? The surcharge? Okay. There's an extra chair. You can take the chair up there. Yeah. All right, you may begin. Yeah. Uh, my name is Chad Arnholt. I am a co-founder of Tin Roof Drink Community. We are a uh, bar design, restaurant, and consulting firm, also an educator. We uh, speak largely on carbon footprint and sustainability issues within the bar industry. Um, and then we work with restaurants and bar industry professionals to kind of prescribe for them how to go forward and be more sustainable. Uh, for, you know, the luxury of time, I'm going to compress what I have to say and just kind of get right to the point. Um, a bunch of points were brought up around straws. Uh, this is in reference to 936. Um, but I think a couple key issues might have been missed. Uh, in our experience, working with bars, um, specifically also restaurants, any time a bar is forced to buy a higher cost item, like a more sustainable biodegradable straw, they tend to cut back in their usage. And when they cut back in their usage by, let's say, not offering them or offering them on demand only, in general, guests tend not to notice at all. In one case, for example, Jimmy's in Aspen, um, when they went to straws on demand only, no one asked, and they almost eliminated their straw consumption completely. So not only are you switching to sustainable, you're also prompting the uh, elimination of use of them at all. Um, so that's one big key issue that was missed. So it's a, it's a, a hidden gain. Another one is I, I would like to clear up the availability of, in the market of useful alternatives. Uh, everyone likes to crush on paper because you know uh, they dissolve sometimes. In fact, that market has improved drastically. There are companies out there that are making things that will last in a gin and tonic for three hours. And uh, if anyone that wants to see them, my business partner has a collection of, of them over there. We've also done a pretty exhaustive study on comparison of price um, that's available online. Uh, Tin Roof Drink Community is my website, or our website. Um, Claire put together a package. You can find those, those uh, alternatives right there. All right, thank you. And I, I just want to, like, for the record, this, this has been sitting in yeah. water for three hours, and it's still intact. Yeah. <laughs> so, oh, it, sorry. It's an exciting field, if, if, you, if you don't mind. Uh, there's Cocktail Kingdom just released reusable uh, uh, plastics that will go 200 washes. There are reeds. There is bamboo. There is an avocado-based uh, bioplastic that, will, that functions just like a normal straw, but it biodegrades. These options are out there for bars and restaurants to use. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, Chairperson Espinal and other members of the committee um, for inviting me to speak today. My name is Jessica Roth. I'm the Director of Advocacy and Engagement at Riverkeeper. I'm here to t today to support Intro number 936, and on behalf of Riverkeeper's thousands of members and supporters, um, through advocacy, pre prevention, community education, and stewardship, Riverkeeper's working towards realizing our vision of a trash-free Hudson. Our annual day of service, Riverkeeper Sweep, engages thousands of New Yorkers from Brooklyn to the Adirondacks at over 100 sites to clean up our shorelines and waterways. This year, volunteers removed 37 tons of trash from the Hudson River and its tributaries, including 6,000 pounds of recycling. Over the past seven years, plastic pollution has constituted one of the main sources of the marine debris at the Riverkeeper Suite. In many cases, we can see the full cycle of degradation occurring in a single cleanup site, with new intact litter sitting beside smaller and smaller pieces that accumulate on the shore. Our direct experience with plastic pollution through research and cleanups on our shorelines underlines the existing science and informs our advocacy to eliminate the scourge of plastic pollution in the <coughs> Hudson River estuary. Data gathered by Riverkeeper and others points to the prevalence of microplastics, which, which can result from degradation of plastic straws and other plastics in waters worldwide, including the Hudson River estuary. 
plastic manufacturing process uses and creates numerous toxic materials and plastics, particularly in wa and, and plastics, particularly in water, accumulate toxins. Pesticides, toxic industrial compounds, including PCBs, as well as pharmaceuticals and other unregulated contaminants, adhere to the plastics and can both contaminate fish and contaminate drinking water supplies. A Lamont Doherty Earth, Observation, Earth Observatory study found microplastics in the digestive tracts of each of the five types of marine organisms it studied. Another study found that nearly all U.S. drinking water supplies sampled, 94% had evidence of microplastic pollution. It's estimated Americans use roughly 500 million straws every day or 1.6 straws per person, which is enough to circle the earth two and a half times per day. The recent ban list 2.0 report prepared by 10 partner organizations analyzed statistics from multiple data sites in order to pinpoint the top 20 pollutants and found that plastic straws and stirrers ranked fifth, accounting for 7.5% of plastic pollution. Alternatives are readily available. I'm not gonna go through that. We've A lot of people have talked about those. I'm encouraged to hear that, that you're talking about um, much more robust conversations with the uh, advocacy groups for folks with disabilities. Um, we are moving, we are generally, as I mentioned, working on a, a trash free Hudson campaign and that involves all single use things and so we wanna make sure that we're getting things right as we're taking these steps um, as we move towards doing this statewide as well. Um, so we're urging New York City to follow in the footsteps of all these other municipalities and to really take the right steps and I will say um, ad lib as a, just as a, as a New Yorker, fourth generation New Yorker, like I carry all of my own stuff with me every day. I have silverware, I have straws. I don't even use straws and I carry straws with me. It's not that hard of a thing, but one of the things that, um, that we really do need to do is we need to move into a really robust education campaign um, as we're moving in this transition about what we need, how we need it, and when we need it with the understanding that there are people that do need these as a, as a tool, but that most of us do not and it's just a question of status quo and we need to move past that. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Espinal. Thank you for this opportunity to testify in support of intro 936. My name is Joyce Friedman. I'm on the board of directors of Voters for Animal Rights, a 501c4 dedicated to helping elect candidates who support animal protection and lobbying for laws to stop animal suffering and cruelty. Voters for Animal Rights strongly supports intro 936. It's time for New York City to get on board with this common sense measure which prohibits two unnecessary items which are used just for a few moments in time but which cause so much long-term suffering and death to millions of sea animals. And it is not just their deaths, but also their um, animal suffering, the animal suffering and pain prior to dying, all from a completely unnecessary item we've simply gotten used to using largely because it is so commonly handed to us. The most painful example of the suffering plastic straws caused to animals is the sea turtle. Everyone has seen screaming agony when the straw is slowly pulled out of his nose with plier-like tools. An additional re recent tragic example I've seen is a recent photo of a large seabird literally putting plastic items with her beak into the open mouth of her hungry baby bird. Except for those who medically need to use them, straws are completely unnecessary, and yet their ubiquity in our society makes us think they're necessary simply because restaurants are giving a straw to every single customer. I'd like to state unequivocally, unequivocally the absurdity of restaurants doing this. We purchase an iced coffee, we're given the cup with a plastic lid, a plastic straw. People take the straw simply because it's handed to them, and drink for a few minutes and then we take the straw lid and cup and toss them in the trash and by some people on the ground often the lid with the straw in it are immediately pulled off and tossed how often have we seen this duo on the sidewalk this process happens millions of times per day by millions of people in fact 500 million straws are used for a few moments and thrown away every single day most of us will be fine drinking from glasses or cups when handed one in an eatery though people use them this is why this legislation is so needed and why voters for animal rights supports and urges the swift passage of this necessary bill to help st stop damaging our wildlife and our oceans. Thank you so much for introducing this. Good afternoon, Chairman Espinal. Eric Goldstein from the Natural Resources Defense Council. We're an international environmental group. that have been active on New York City issues since 1970. We appreciate your leadership on this issue and we strongly support the goals and objectives of Intro 936. 
three quick points which will summarize our written testimony. First, regarding the issues raised by the disability community, uh, we share their concerns. We know you share their concerns, regardless of the final language of intro 936. We know that it must be designed in a way to ensure that it does not place new hurdles in the way of some of our most vulnerable residents. We know that's your intent. We hope you sit down with them and go over the final language. Second, we believe the starting point for the operative section of this bill should be language that requires all food service establishments to dispense straws and beverage stirs only on demand. A great deal of consumption of straws and stirs in New York City is simply unwanted and unnecessary, neither requested by customers nor utilized by them even when provided. Requiring that straws and stirs be only uh, served on demand could reduce litter and pollution, be implemented in a very short time period, save money for retail establishments, and all this without any adverse impacts. Finally, we suggest that the bill language be modified to clarify that all straws and stirs uh, offered by food service establishments be made of commercially compostable materials, uh, as that term is defined by the Biodegradable Pro uh, Products Institute. Ensuring that all these straws and stirrers are used, that are used are compostable is needed to help address another key challenge facing the city's waste disposal system, which is to remove contaminants from the city's organic waste stream so that that could be used productively. The bill's existing language references biodegradability. That's a tricky term and is defined differently depending on upon who is asked. We recommend that the final bill language requires straws and stirrers to be compostable, as that term is defined by the uh, highest standards set by national uh, grading institutions. We stand ready to work with you on the final language, and again, appreciate your leadership and support. Hi, my name is Bill Levy. I've been a New York City resident for 17 years, and I'm the founder and CEO of a company called NACO. It's N-A-E-C-O. It's actually the word ocean reversed. And our goal is to provide products that are viable replacements to single-use plastics. We're based here in New York. We've chosen to stay here in New York and to <clears throat> offer viable alternatives We've heard a lot today. Um, thank you for your leadership um, in this issue, and certainly I'm not going to repeat some of the statistics, but I think I just wanted to offer a voice as a, as, as a taxpayer and as a citizen here, you know, we are subsidizing the use of, of plastics. We spend an incredible amount of money to dispose of those, to try to find a place to put them. We've learned that there are very few places left and obviously we've talked a lot about that today. Um, so when we look at the cost parity, it's actually that we're subsidizing the use of polystyrene and polypropylene. And this is really not about banning a product or practice. I want the committee to think about this as just banning a toxic material use, that we have viable alternatives we've been talking about, some that should either be uh, certified compostable by the BPI, or that maybe in the case of paper or bamboo, are in fact uh, viable and, and hopefully will address the needs of the disability community too, which we're very sensitive to. Um, <clears throat> and obviously as um, a business owner, we just want to make sure to, um, to clarify that, uh, you know, for, for anyone interested in a better New York and a better future, I think the, the question we have to ask is if we choose not to do this, what message does that really send? And so for a better future, for a better New York, thank you for your consideration. Uh, thank you, my name is James Malleus. I'm the uh, I'm managing partner and in-house counsel for a restaurant group that's been in New York for 30 years. Uh, I've also spoken out in Cranes and New York Times in support of uh, having a standard wage and a, and a tip that is able to be shared across front and the back of the house. Uh, people touched on most of the arguments, but I want to give you some examples that hopefully will uh, stay with you and tell you why this is good for business, workers, and consumers. So we've been in business for 30 years, and the last restaurant we went to open was in the Hamptons. 
because it was too difficult in New York City. So like, let that like sort of sink with you. We had to go out to the Hamptons because we thought it was a better economic opportunity than New York City. We've been here for 30 years. By way of labor, I think it's good for labor. Uh, people talked about the economic disparity. We haven't, eight years ago, I used to post for cooks. I get like 75 people apply. Now I get like five, maybe 10, and five of them probably haven't even worked in a kitchen. That's because it used to be when my grandfather came here that if you were unskilled, the kitchen was a legitimate way to find a living. Now you can be an Uber driver. You can participate in what's called the sharing economy. I'm not sure exactly who shares in it, but that's where a lot of those people go. So we have an epic labor shortage, and the only way to do that is to be able to pay a, a real viable increased wage to the back of the house. And unless the state allows tips to be shared across the back of the house, which is not necessarily guaranteed, we won't be able to have cooks. They just won't exist. Um, the, so it's good, for, it's good for reducing the disparity for workers. Um, it's good for the economics of the business. And as far as the business goes, it would allow us to actually compensate people based on seniority and merit, which is how everyone else compensates people. But we can't because we're told that basically 20% of our annual sales, which is what people tip on their own, pretty much tip 20%, we're told can only go to a small subset of the people that, ex that affect their meal experience. How many, the last way I'll put it this way, when you go out to tip, how many times did you say, the food was great, or it came quickly, or the bathroom was clean? Well, the people who do that can't share in those wages or those gratuities. Changing this law would allow us to change that. Thank you so much for uh, adding another person to your panel. Uh, I represent uh, uh, seven restaurants, all in uh, Manhattan, in New York City. So uh, my colleagues couldn't say it better. Can you say your name? Yes, Paola Pedrignani. And uh, what I wanted to um, make even so more clear, this industry is dying if we don't do something. It, you know, I worked in this industry for 25 years. It changed tremendously, but the rules are not changing consequently to the, to the big changes. Nobody even talked about, it, you know, what we, has been said about the back of the house and the front of the house. It's the, the, if there is one thing that you take out and, and brings with you, bring with you today, that should be it. The back of the house is, is not compensated in the right way compared to the front of the house because we cannot do it with the rules that are in place right now. And this is so unfair because it's not only the service. Somebody has to cook this meal that you enjoy when you go to a restaurant. But also, as us as an owners, we spend so much money for the paperwork that we, we need to do in order to run a restaurant. The insurance that we have to buy, just because unscrupulous lawyers, uh, every day of the year, they uh, do these um, frivolous lawsuits on us uh, just to try to extort like an easy five, ten thousand dollars. We have to go to a lawyer, pay big money just to even start a defense against us. So it's, it's an industry that has been taken um, for granted uh, and that you could squeeze it infinitely and it keep, it keep on producing. It's not happening right now. A lot of restaurants are closing. Please help us to save the industry with this surcharge. Thank you so much to all of you for your testimony. Is there anyone else that was left out? Going once, going twice, gone. All right, well, thank you all for your testimony. Um, just on the record, uh, I, I do support all three bills, uh, but we do have to go through the process of getting uh, the votes needed um, and the uh, revisions to be made on these bills before we move forward with them. So with that said, uh, this hearing is adjourned.